friend of mine. He's an expert in multimedia, and there's actually, I think, the main, one of the main reasons why he's here is that he spent a lot of time working and trying to go from multimedia to concepts and high level representation of media like events. So, thank you, Nico. Right, so it seems that uh, today is a Trento uh, day. And I'm going to have a completely different style of presentation. So while Fausto was successful in being laid with 50 slides, I will try to be in, in time with 270 slides, so uh, we'll see. Um, so my goal today is to do a kind of walk through, through multimedia content analysis. So I don't know how many of you are working on image video analysis. Okay, okay, so uh, anyway, I, I, because I, I didn't know from the beginning exactly what is the level here, so I kind of keep it at the very high level, so I will try to explain some of the main concepts anyway. So, a little bit about my research group, so I have about, so since I moved to, I, I used to be at the University of Amsterdam until 2009, and then I moved to Trento, and I have now a pretty large group, about 20 people from everywhere. And then after doing, this is, this is actually an old photo, but uh, now uh, many of these people have been, um, have been moving away and so on. But then uh, while thinking about our research, I realized that we are all anarchists. And this, I realized this one when one of my students just sent me this image. Okay, so, uh, so this was taken during the Indignados day. He was in MIT in Boston, right? And just he was moving around with this, uh, you know, manifesto. So I assume we all want to support the vector machines, right? Okay, there could be some other anarchical kind of movement like free variable and these kind of things, right? So, so we all do this kind of... Uh... Okay. Another thing that I'm always talking with my, with my group, it's about state of the art, okay? So now everybody is using let's say deep learning, it seems to be quite a fashion about it, right? And actually I found this cartoon and I asked my postdoc, to, uh, my postdocs to put it on their, um, on, on their door so they realize what, what means state of the art. Well, this is not complete, there are like three slides. Okay, so let's assume that you have done this AI robot, whatever, okay? And it's good that you just find an object, point at it and say, this is a cat. Wow. And then you get a real user and said, well, hey, is that a robot? And you say, no, this is not just any robot. This is the current state of the art in artificial intelligence. Great, and then you keep on saying, we have trained a nine layer locally sparse Sengute encoder with pooling, blah, 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 all these kind of details, right? And then you keep on saying, you have 3,000, if it was trained for three days on a cluster of 1,000 machines comprising 16,000 cores. And you can now recognize 22,000 different object categories with 15.8 accuracy, okay? And then you said, well, this is quite impressive, right? And then the user, let's say my mother, say, is this impressive? I mean, like 20 years ago, you were kind of defeated the, the world chess champion. You were building all these machines that were able to, uh, to kick uh, the respective asses of the two best Jeopardy champions of all time, right? What happened to the HAL 9000 by 2001 and so on, right? And then the user said, you call this progress? And then you said, well, sorry, we are now due with our awesomeness. And then, of course, your machine is kind of making mistake, right? So it keeps on saying cat all the time, okay? So, so the idea is here that even if for us, let's say, of course, you said, there are 20,000 different categories, 15.8% is pretty impressive, right? It's far, far better than chance. But for the real users, this kind of number, the number that we obtain at the moment are really completely unuse, uh, unuseful, okay? So they don't know what to do. If you, if you just tell somebody that one out of seven, you, you provide the right answer, the user will say, no, this is pretty bad. And it is pretty bad, okay? Because from the practical point of view, one out of seven is very bad. Of course, if you, if you take the chance level, it will be one out of uh, 20,000, but the user from the practical point of view, they don't realize this. Okay, so that's why I asked my postdoc to put it on the, on, on, the, on their door, so they realize they are not as awesome that they would believe they are. Okay, so what we try to do, we try to attain better multimedia content understanding, and in order to do that, we have a few questions. These are some of the questions I'm going to discuss in detail in the second part of the talk, but I said, well, let's put them from the beginning so you have an idea about what I'm going to cover, okay? So first of all, feature selection. So there are millions of features out there. How do you really try to do this? Okay, is there any way to, to, to obtain a compact feature representation 
And in order to do that, you want to improve the accuracy of multimedia analysis. Then, moving from there, how do you do when you are going to, when, when you, this is a real, um, real life analysis in which you have only few labeled images or videos, right? So you have to deal with that. You don't want to have the user labeled a huge amount of ground truth data, but you want to be able to deal with, let's say, with a sparsity of, of, um, of labeled data. And in that way, you want to deal with semi-supervised learning. Then, of course, multimedia analysis. We have many ways of extracting data. Could be text, could be video, could be images, and so on. One of the research that we did, and this is what I'm going to present, is how do we really use images to improve text retrieval, which is kind of counterintuitive. Usually, many people were using text to improve video and image analysis. We, we tried, and I will show you some examples. We, we, we managed to use images to improve text retrieval. Then, if you can do a classifier-specific representation, so instead of doing an explicit concept dissection process, we want to learn intermediate representation that is kind of more generic and can be reused for other type of concepts. Right, so I'm learning, for example, some representation for, intermediate representation for animals, and then I'm adapting them to different categories. We'll, we'll show you in details a little bit how we do this. And finally, how do we do knowledge adaptation? So how can we guarantee reasonable multimedia event detection accuracy when we have only very few positive examples? Okay, I will come back to these questions one by one and I will show you some precise solutions to this. This will be in the second part of the talk. Okay, so uh, this is the generic framework in which we will try to put all these modules together. I will also talk a little bit about deep learning but more as a, let's say, as a very generic uh, a level since this is something that people use nowadays. Okay, so since this is a summer school about knowledge representation, semantics, and so on, I was thinking to show you an example, and I would put, uh, I put everything under this umbrella of the first part, at least, of things and stuff, right? So what we try to do, we try to put things will be object into the context of stuff, right? So let's say stuff will be the context. So a thing will be an object with a specific size, shape, properties, and so on, right? So this, you have some examples, could be any object that you want. Stuff will be something that is kind of generic, right? So it doesn't have, it's not very specific necessarily, right? It's a material defined by homogeneous or repetitive patterns. So you have a good texture, you have fine scale properties, but have no specific or distinctive spatial extents of the shape. Yeah, so you can have backgrounds if you want. And a typical example would be Try to find things in here. Right? This is an, um, an, a, satellite a satellite image and you want to find, for example, cars. Okay? If you just run, you just learn a detector for cars. You just get a lot of examples of cars, I don't know, some kind of block-based stuff, rectangular and so on. If you apply it onto here, you're going to get this type of things, right? But then, and these are their localization. Now the question is, how do you tell which one is a car? From the appearance point of view, they all look very similar. This could be a car very well, at least from the way it looks like at this resolution. But then if it puts a context into account, and this is what I will discuss a bit later, and you say, well, but this is a building. I mean, of course, you can always have a car on top of the building. You may get some examples, some crazy people that put their car just for fun, but in general, you, you believe and you know that the cars are sitting on, are staying on the roads. So if there is a building that is very unlikely that that detection, even if it has a very, very high detection score, it's very unlikely that to be a car. Could be anything else. Okay, so the context is the key in this case. Okay, so let's say, how do you put context? And I think context is quite important. I gave, I, I, I find some, some interesting examples, right? So let's take it something, something very simple. So this is a speed limit, okay? Sign. This is a mariachi, okay? So what's happen if I put them together? So what does it mean? Mexicans are allowed, okay, so are not allowed because it's a, uh, what else? And this is actually, is a real sign, actually was a real sign, somewhere here. Any idea where this is? Doesn't look like South America or some other things. 
It's in Europe. It's in Zurich. And you say, well, well what has this Mexican sign to do with the tram of, in Zurich? Okay, so it's here. Okay, so in Zurich, this doesn't mean that Mexicans are not allowed in the tram, but they put it like, you know, as a cool sign, meaning that singing is not allowed in the tram. Okay? Of course, if you put the same sign in Southern California or in Florida, it will really mean that Mexican cannot go into the tram. Okay? So again, the context is quite important. And then the Mexican, so, so Daniel is uh, Mexican, it's uh, one of my friends, he lives in, uh, in Switzerland. He told me that actually the Mexican embassy made a complement to the Zurich city. And then what they did, they just changed the sign to these kind of things. Okay? So this is kind of, let's say, culturally less offending in some way. Of course, for example, in Vienna, I, I don't have the photo of it, but they had similar signs in which they have male and female. Okay, so it was, a, for example, there is a digging sign in which you have the shower, the man with the shower. They had the man and the, and, the, and the girl with the ponytail, just to make sure that you are not making discrimination. So again, you can go to all these crazy, crazy examples. Uh, another thing, you can get it from the spatial context, right? So if somebody is telling you, look, I'm, I'm, I have a detector, a perfect detector, that is detecting humans, a bounding box of a human, a bounding box of the horse, and then the question is, is this a riding horse or a feeding horse? So are you riding the horse here or are you feeding the horse? And then, of course, just having the relative locations, you say, well, I have the human on top of the horse. So then it's likely that I'm going to ride the horse rather than I'm feeding the horse. I may probably feed the horse while I'm on top of it, but that's very difficult, I would say. Okay, so if you just put it into the right context, you can immediately disambiguate because of that. Right, so again, just by simply looking at spatial content, you can put your, you have some detectors which are not perfect. So even the humans there is just not perfect, the bounding box. Still, using the spatial context constraints, you can achieve much better results. And then, of course, there is always, if you get a patch, something like that, it's not very well visible there, but, and I'm asking you what it is there, you say, well, I don't know. It's just some kind of blob with some kind of dark things on some whitish background. But then, of course, if you put it to the context, that, that thing, the same patch, may mean a lot of things, right? So here, even if it's very blurred, you can tell, well, this is pro these are probably the hands. The same patch, if you put it here, so this is a pedestrian, these are some cars. This could be some shoes. That will be a mobile phone, right? So a single patch by itself doesn't tell you much. But if you just put them together and you put them in the context, then you can achieve some, some well understanding. Okay, so this is exactly what I'm going to, to talk about in next. Okay, so I'm going to, to have in the first part go very briefly, let's say, to some standard approaches in computer vision and object recognition. Okay? Um, you will say, yeah, but maybe some of these things are kind of old. People are now using deep learning and so on. Yes, it's true, but on the other hand, I think by the way, we do this type of analysis, you can understand a little bit the machine. So the machine we are developing. In the deep learning, it's a little bit more obscure. I'm going to talk a little bit about deep learning later, but I think it's important to understand the main concept and what was at least the state of the art in, um, in computer vision until like two, three years ago. Okay, so what we want to do, well, we have a scene, and then we have the representation of the scene at different levels, right? So the scene is composed of objects, Objects are composed of parts, parts are composed of features, right? So it's this, 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 this hierarchy which we want to use in order to obtain, uh, let's say, the scene representation, scene analysis. And then the statistical viewpoint, let's say, for object recognition is that I'm getting an image and I want to represent, actually, the probability of having the zebra given the image versus the probability of no zebra given the image, right? This is very simple probabilistic approach for that. And then if I apply the Bayes rules, the rule, then I'm just getting into these two elements in which the first one is a posterior ratio because I'm getting this probability after I see the image, right? I have the likelihood ratio in which I'm modeling the probability of the image given the zebra class and the prior ratio, right? So what is the a priori chance of having a zebra in my image? So how many categories I'm going to have in there? Okay, 
So this is a standard approach, and now there are two different approaches. One is a discriminative method in which we model the posterior. So there, I don't care about how the class is distributed. I don't care about how the zebra class is distributed, but I care about the discriminant, the separation between class zebra and many other classes, or the generative method in which I'm modeling the zebra class and modeling any other class of the object, okay? Yeah, so in discriminative part, I'm just doing the separation of the, um, uh, the posterior modeling in which practically what I'm learning, I'm learning the decision boundary between different classes. So I'm having instances, so here will be one versus all. I have instances of zebras, uh, motorbikes, and whatever it is. And then I'm trying to model the, the decision boundary. While in the, in the generative part, I'm just getting parts of a zebra of the class, and I'm just building, let's say, a model. Could be a Gaussian, could be anything you want to put in there. And then I'm getting probability. If I get a, an image in here, I just look through all these probabilities, and I can tell, well, is it a zebra? Well, no, because this is very low. The other one, it's, uh, it's kind of middle. Here you have this probability is very high. The other one is below the threshold. Right? So again, here, every single class using training example, most of the cases, I'm just building some large Gaussians in which I'm modeling each class separately. OK, so there are three main issues. So one will be how to represent an object category. Yeah, so features, classifier, and so on. How to form the classifier, giving the training data, if you have training data available. How the classifier is to be used on noble data. This is the generalization part. Yes? Sorry? Well, here I'm just talking in general. No, I mean, that one was just a, an, an example, just a funny example. But it depends. It depends on the problem. It depends. In many cases, yes, you may have up to 20,000 categories. Uh, of course, accuracy, it's, it's far less than 15% in this case, depending on the categories. OK, so the object detection, you, f you try to find things. Yes, yeah, so find all the cars in this image. And you want to return a bounding box for each of these instances of the car. You want to maximize the true positive and to minimize the false positives. Right? So you want to, to maximize the detections, correct detection, and you want to minimize the false detections. This is, in general, the object detection uh, part. So what you do, in general, in the sliding window, you just get a, a model of the category. Let's say you have learned how is the appearance of a car. So then what you do, you have a template, you just move it all around, and you try to find, you, you, you try to find all shifts, all scales, possible or rotation, in order to obtain detection for this category. You, see, you would say, yeah, but this is not very efficient. That's correct, and this is what we are going to, ad to address after that, right? So at the beginning, so this is what was a few years ago, people will just do that. It will be an exhaustive search, take the template, move it all around, where you have high detection rates, you say, well, here I, it's likely I'm going to have a car. Where you have low stuff, you say, well, this is unlikely to be a car. Yeah, so you get some detection scores. Some of them may, may be negative. And each window will get a score, and then the detection will be the local peaks in this D of W. Okay, very simple stuff. Of course, the process that covers the entire image so you are sure, or at least sure, that you are going to cover all the possible location of the car, of the, um, of the location of the object. Yeah? It's flexible because you can have a variety of, uh, well, this kind of scores. Of course, the consequence, the, co the contrary part is that the brute force can be very slow and only consider the features in a particular box. So there are no context. There is no context in there. Okay, so I'm just getting one of these blocks. And I look at it, well, does it look like being a car? Well, yes or no, maybe yes, maybe not. But of course, here you don't consider what kind of, what is the location of the particular uh, bounding box and what is the context with the other bounding boxes. Yeah, so what you have, given an image or video collections, you want to find the object containing a specific object. Because, uh, well, the image is containing a specific object. For example, you want to find cars. And then you have to deal with all these kind of simple problems. So has to be viewpoint, you have to deal with viewpoint changes, with location, different locations, illumination conditions. So here I have some of you examples, right? They look pretty different. Illumination is different. Here I have the car taken from a surveillance camera. There I have the car taken from another viewpoint. So we have to deal with this. On top of that is 
how you define a car or let's say a particular object let's say a chair in this example these are all chairs yeah they are chairs because they have the same functionality but of course they look completely different so probably appearance is not always good enough right so if I, if I look at the appearance this chair it's completely different from the other chair but still people will say if I if I have to to call this one, it will say, well, maybe it's a type of chair. Maybe it's not a chair, maybe it's an armchair, maybe whatever, but it's still the same kind of category. From the functionality point of view, it's still okay. So again, the definition of this, it's quite important. Okay, so the first intuition would be, well, I'm going to get an object, I'm doing some segmentation, meaning that I'm separating the object from the background, and then from there, I can just model this as a kind of part base. So, well, this is a... A horse, why? Because it has a tail, because it has, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the head has four legs and the kind of things. Right, so this type of approaching, approaches, so the apartment model have been developed even in the, in the 70s. Right, so this was one of the classical stuff in which, so this, was, this is an example of the face, in which you just have kind of a spring system in which you have eyes, nose, and so on, and then it's like if you are if you want to deal with every single instance of the face, you say, well, but somebody has a broader face, a narrow face, larger, whatever. So then if you just move, take the springs and move them around, you, keep, you still keep the location, right? But you can have different instances of the same face. So that was something that they proposed in the 73. And of course, they said that in this way you can solve AI. Of course, it has not been solved. It's not solved even yet today. But it's, 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 a, cool, uh, it's a cool progress. So one of the main problems is that segmentation doesn't really work, okay? So you may have several solutions for segmentation. So this is just an example. You want to segment this object to say, I want to get a palm tree or something. Well, this scene, you would say it's a palm tree, it's some beach, uh, well, water and some uh, mountain and sky, but you get many other segments in here. Okay, the same in the other case. So this never resulted in the necessary accuracy for subsequent recognition. So if I want to detect the palm tree, I'm probably going to, to miss some part of the tree, some parts of the leaves, and so on. So this is not going to work by itself very well. On, on, and the other way, you can say, well, I'm not going to do any segmentation, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to do, let's say, patches. I'm going to detect patches. I want to say, for example, I want to detect wheels. I want to detect some particular parts of the object. And then having this detection, so each color will have, let's say, one detection of a part. If I put them in the right order, if I can detect them in the specially uh, same way, then I can obtain a representation of the particular category I have, right? So on the other hand, if I have an object which has, um, let's say, wheels, it has some steering wheel, has some kind of, uh, well, tail and so on, then it's very likely that Oh, okay, I'm too loud, as I said. No, okay. you're not so loud, but... I told you I'm loud, so... <laughs> well, maybe, maybe let it there, maybe I can, it will be uh, loud enough. <coughs> no, it's, it's fine, it's fine, I mean... Okay? It's fine with me. Yeah, so the idea here is if you can just, I will try to speak also not so loud, so. So the idea is that here if you just detect different parts, if you put them together, let's say specially together, then you can also get a good evidence of the presence of the object. So this is about 2003 that, uh, you know, Rob Fergus uh, and so on and his guys were working on this. So then what came next, I'm going to go very, very, very fast through this were the idea of the bag of words. So this is just, you have no segmentation at all, you have no location at all. What does it mean? It means that if I just take the previous images I had before, I just get patches, so this is a dense sampling. I scramble them around, right? If I represent them as a histogram or whatever feature I have, I still be able to detect a car. Of course you will say, but this is not an image of a car at all. Then if I put them together in my model, and if I build a good enough classifier, then I can still detect reasonable this object. 
Yeah, so how does it work? Very briefly, because this is something that probably many of you already know. You just get then sampling, or you can get some features or whatever. From there, for each of them, you extract pixel-wise gradient responses. You can have hooks, you can have many other features. You obtain the, let's say, the sift representation, which is very standard. You have a descriptor space projection, right? So each of these patches represents the descriptor space as a point. I'm getting many other descriptors. And now, if I get more images, I just get the population of the descriptor space. And now what I want to do is to, to detect some boundaries, some clusters, in which I could say, well, if a point is in that particular area of the descriptor space, then it's a car or it's a whatever it is, a, a cow or whatever it is, right? So I'm getting clustering stuff, so I'm getting prototypes, so this is dictionary learning. And then I'm learning this classifier based on my training data, yeah? So this cluster is called a visual word. In other words, here in this way, I can deal with variation of my object. Yeah? So here I can have a cow, but can be different type of cow, so I can still have variation here, and the main requirement here is that the interclass, right, so, so, so the difference between, um, so, so, so the difference of the object within the class are smaller than the distance between any single object from here and an object from another. If I can achieve that, then I can do a good partitioning, I can do a good object recognition. Okay? So, and then, getting that clustering part, what I can do, I can just do a global representation. Right? I can obtain a histogram, and then I can use this histogram as, um, if, I, if I use it for different classes, I can use it as a, as a class signature. And then when I have a new image, I'm trying to see if this particular bag, so just for the bag or worse, it's representative for this image or not. In other way, if I have many classes, if I take a new image, I will just compute the likelihood of classifying that particular image in any of these classes. And then I'm just getting the one that obtains the maximum response. Right? So it will be the maximum likelihood approach. Very simple. Okay, so here I take several images, I'm obtaining different representation, different uh, histograms, and I'm representing them into uh, the, the vector space, and then I can get the boundary like using, I don't know, SVM or many other things. Okay? And some of the details so in the time, so what you can have, you can have extre extreme dense sampling at every single pixel. You can have local patches. You can have different type of uh, features. You can have different visual vocabulary way of using random forest and other kind of things. You can use SVM and other things. This is some kind of typical representation of the bag of words. And these kind of things, if you want to have a very fast, if you want to develop a very fast prototype for image analysis, this is easily done. It's already probably available. You, you don't have to, to do much. So in OpenCV, for example, you already have this, this type of things. Okay, so if you do that, you obtain, this is some examples. You have, um, uh, this is the class images. This is the highest ranked. This is for the airplane. Pretty good. This is uh, the lowest ranked. Some of them are not too bad, so this is, a, this is again, it's, a, it's an airplane as well. This is another image of the airplane, but this is our lower rank. These are far more difficult than before. These are some non-class images, so the higher rank of non-class, you can get some birds, some other kind of things. So it's pretty, pretty reasonable in, 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 in what it does. This is for the bicycles. Of course, some of them are, are far more difficult, like this one, for example, here. So you just get some, something that looks like it's a part of a bicycle, it's still reasonable, well uh, uh, recognized, and this is, this is a bounding box that, that represents that well, the location of the bicycle is here. Of course, you would want to, to make sure that, for example, so this one, it's still a bicycle, but it's not recognized, so it's considered as a non-class image. And then, of course, a motorbike will have very much similarity with the bicycle class, so here you always have this type of problems. <coughs> well, this is for the cats. And then again, the highest ranked non-cat images, you would want to have something like dogs, right? Because the dogs and cats are very similar in some way. So some of the images are maybe even ambiguous to some degree. Okay, so the conclusion for the bag of words. So works well enough for retrieval purposes, and it's very fast to implement, and it's something that, you know, if you want to do something very fast prototype, you can use it. No segmentation, no object location, okay? And then, of course, in that case, you get something that is fast. It's not necessarily very accurate, right? So you don't have any assumption here. You just assume that from the statistical point of view, I'm obtaining this image representation uniquely in such a way that I'm able to detect 
the, the, um, um, to classify the image to a particular right class. So some of the questions that come to mind is that how do we lo uh, what do we lose by ignoring the object location? So in other words, if we just incorporate the object location, can we achieve better results? Yes, what I'm going to show you. And then important it will be which parts of the image are important for recognition, right? So if I want to detect a bicycle, what will be important? The bicycle itself, the bicycle with the context. For example, I know that the bicycle, if I can detect, for example, stuff, what we discussed before, so I detect roads or other kind of things. If I detect a road and there is a, a, a bounding box that seems to be a bicycle, wow, that looks fine. Could be, I mean, uh, let's say the, the, the stuff that I can detect can enhance the detection of a bicycle. If I detect, for example, grass, maybe it's less likely to be a bicycle on the grass. Or if I detect sky, I think bicycles, they do not really stay on the, on the sky or whatever, unless I'm taking very, very artistical photographs. If I'm using this information, I may disambiguate and I can, I, I can improve my detection accuracy. Okay? Um, so which part of the object is more important for recognition? Well, if I have several bounding boxes, right? So I take the, last, the, the entire image. I take only a bounding box around that object. Then I take it, the yellow one will be kind of really, really very tight, the blue one very tight on the object. So I take only a part of the object. So I have many, many ways of extracting bounding boxes. So which one of these is the best? Which one of these will, will give me the best result? And not only that, how do I really do it? How do I really select from these bounding boxes the one that is really the most informative? Okay? So how does back of world classify images? As I said, we have this representation. In other words, if we look at the back projection, so if I take now that particular space and I want to back project onto the image, I'm obtaining some kind of evidence of what will be a car, right? And you see many of these car attributes, so that the yellow stuff in this case, are on the car and very little outside the car. So theoretically, I would want to be able to detect, let's say, the exact location as the one that gives me the most information in there. Yeah, so if I take some images like this, uh, so what it is, for example, um, so this is, this is for boats, you can detect so the yellow will be the important part, and you see that most of the signals are going to be where the object is located, right? So you see here, small boats, also some small, some, some. so somehow this is what you would want to do. So you can just look back of the, of the response and try to see how this works. This is for cats. Again, it's very hard to tell, but you can see the response here, it's quite higher. So this is the face of the cat, so the same here and so on. I think I have, this is for people and so on. Right, so theoretically, you get some information from the bag of words if you do the back projection. So the problem with the bag of words is that really works uh, on local details. Even so, some of the details are there are larger than the patches, right? So here we said, well, you can have a 16 by 16 patch, but why 16 by 16 and not larger or smaller and so on, right? Um, and then the bag of words uses details from both the object and its surroundings, right? Because in general, what you put in there in your classifier, you don't, you don't necessarily learn the object characteristics, but you also learn the background. In other words, for example, you can just learn that boats are always on the water. And this is why, because in most of the training images, you will see the boat that is floating in the water. And then, of course, if I, if, I, if I want to classify an image of a boat that is not on the water, I may have trouble. Because the classifier learns that boats, or patches that have some object stuff and water, is characteristic for boats, rather than cows, for example. Okay, so there I'm not learning the object itself, but I'm learning the surrounding. And this kind of overfitting to some degree. So I'm learning that cows are always on the grass, so birds are always in the sky, boats are, uh, boats are always in the water. Which, which could be okay in most of the cases, but it's not always true. Okay? And the individual details are not very object or surrounding specific in the bag of words. So this is, this is one of the main problems. So again, so this is a bag of words part, and it looks like this, practically this is the back projection. Right, so the green in this case would be the car location, more or less. Um, now, if I take just the bounding box around the car, I can see that the green part, it's, it has a much stronger response. 
So this means that, of course, if I just use a good bounding box, I can obtain the much stronger um, response to my class category in this case. So it should be beneficial. Right? So if I use only global bag of words, I get a zero, zero 0.5 mean average precision. This is some way in which, I mean, you get, you represent the images in the score, you make a score, and then you represent how much they are in the top and then how many of them are in the top, with top 10 or whatever you want to put in there. If you use object only, you get a, a quite, quite a large increase in mean average precision just by using object only stuff. Yeah, so it's about 26% improvement, right? So now if the object location is known, then the surrounding will add very little information because I know where the object is, so then even if I put it in, let's say, strong, un unlikely context, I am still able to detect it, okay? So I think it's quite important to incorporate the notion of object location. Okay, so let's see now, this means that we want to do some kind of selective search, so not getting any bounding box, right, like we'll be in the sliding window. You know, instead of just going everywhere, I try to be, to be more selective and getting the bounding boxes that will give me the best information. Okay, so the localization with the selective search, it's, it's quite exhaustive, right? So what I do, I need to look at every single scale, shift, and so on, and then I may have something like in the order of a million locations in an image. Right? It imposes huge computational constraints on the subsequent method, meaning that if I just have to look at a million possible locations for every single image, then I need to learn I have a large data set of a million images and so, so then everything is going to be strong. Okay? So I need to be more efficient in that because otherwise I'm not going to be able to detect to work fine with, uh, with objects. Right? So if I do segmentation on the other hand, you have very little location, but capture very few objects, or at least parts of the object, right? So none of them is quite good enough, right? So this is um, the comparison. So this is, these are, let's say, the two extremes. So you want us to have something in between. You want to get something that is specific like segmentation, but probably better. And you don't want to go through all the location, but you want to have a method to, to kind of obtain directly to have a selective method to obtain the, the search. Yeah, so you want to get high recall. Yeah, so this means that in my, um, what I want to present, I want to get a lot of instances which have potential uh, candidates. And I, I'm also making the assumption that the course location are sufficient, meaning that I don't want to do a segmentation around the object. I don't care about the bounding of the object, but just getting a bounding box meaning that I also have a little bit of background incorporated, it should be sufficient, right? And this, this way it should be fast to compute, yeah? So one assumption is that an image is intrinsically hierarchical, yeah? So you cannot have a segmentation at a single scale in order to find all the objects, because you may have several instances of objects at different scales, right? So this is quite important. So then what you do usually in selective search, so this is a method uh, that was developed by uh, my former postdoc, uh, Jasper Edding. He's now a uh, postdoc here in, uh, in Edinburgh. Um, so you start with an over-segmentation. Okay, so why over-segmentation? Well, because I want to make sure that I'm not losing any significant part of the object. Okay, if I do another segmentation, I may lose some parts. Right, so I just get an over-segmentation, whatever segmentation you have. Right, could be, this is the one of first as well, but you can do some many other things. Then, you can have different layers. So what you do, you do some hierarchical grouping of segments, and practically what you do, you have a pyramid in which you take several neighboring uh, patches and you just cluster them together. And then if you do that, you can obtain at different levels several types of objects. So here you can have, let's say, the outline of the cow, you may have the cow by itself, so at different levels you obtain different types of objects. And then what you do, you obtain this object hypothesis from all hierarchical levels, right? So this is all the object hypothesis. Of course, now I don't have all the, all, I don't have all the locations, I don't have a million locations, but I'm going to have something around a thousand. Some of them, of course, will contain the cow, some other may not, okay? But at this moment, I don't know. But then what I'm going to do, I'm going to invent some, I'm going to look at some system to do some pruning of those particular locations. 
Yeah? So no single segmentation strategy works everywhere, which makes sense, right? And we also, because of that, you need to have a set of complementary segmentation strategies. Why so? Because here, for example, if I want to segment the body of this lady, color will work very well, right? Because she is dressed all in, uh, let's say, blue. Okay? While in the other case, if I just apply color, it's not going to work fine because the cat has many color patches. So their baby picture is going to work. Right? So instead of just saying, look, I'm applying one type of segmentation which may work for some images, may not work for other images, I'm just applying many segmentation algorithms. I'm trying to get many different types of, uh, of solutions. And then at the subsequent stage, I'm deciding which one is the most relevant. <coughs> <coughs> so what Jasper and uh, well, my former colleagues in Amsterdam were doing, were doing hierarchical grouping. As I said, so you have several of these levels. You use a variety of color spaces with complementary invariant properties. Right, so they will develop in Amsterdam, they were looking quite a lot of color invariants. Um, and then you have different grouping criteria. So you can group the, the patches based on color, based on texture, based on size, based on many other things. Right? And then you have different type of methods in which you have a fast one, in which you have eight different hierarchical groupings, so this is much faster. Or one for quality, in which you have like 80 different hierarchical groupings. Right, so practically what you do in this stage, you don't take any decision, but then you represent your space not as much as in exhaustive search, not in the sliding window, but you have still, instead of having a single solution, you try to get many solutions. And then during learning, you try to see which one is probably the most um, informative. Yeah, so if you do that, this is different type of variants, this is different color space, um, this is a way of using the segmentation different type of things, you can just play around with, uh, so this is a mean average based, best overlap. I'm going to have it in the next slide what it means. So this is the overlap between your object location and the ground truth provided by, this is Pascal Visual Object Challenge. And you can see that you can go from very fast, but mean average uh, best overlap is like 7%. You can go to something slower, it's about, in that time was about 17 um, seconds per image but then you get a very good overlap. So here you have like 362 locations. Here you get to some 10,000 locations. So again, you can play around with accuracy versus uh, complexity. Yeah, so this is a Pascal overlap criteria. So the Pascal is um, it's a, it's an image retrieval challenge in which they have uh, 20 different categories taken from the internet. Well, very heterogeneous, like cats, uh, dogs, uh, monitor, sofa, I don't even remember many other things, pretty, pretty broad. And um, they have all this, so the, um, the challenge has the, the ground truth, so the bounding boxes for all the objects. And then uh, in order to obtain the, um, uh, the detection rate, what you do, you just get the ground truth bounding box, you get your bounding box, and then you compute what is the amount of overlap. So, it's considered to be correctly localized if the best overlap is it's, it's on top of 50%. Yeah. And then if you just do this type of analysis, so this is if you do the selective search, you can see that, of course, this is the depending on the number of object boxes. So here the recall is going high. You see that this method, it's, it's definitely better than what, uh, what used to be before. And this is now selective search and most telling window, which I'm going to talk uh, next, it's, they are really considered uh, the state of the art in this object localization. So in the Pascal GOC, were, uh, for many years, my colleagues were, were quite, quite successful in, in doing object localization. This is uh, an example. This is a mean average best, best overlap. So same here, the results are much better. This is some examples of the numbers you can obtain depending on the number of windows, depending of um, the recall and so on. So for us, the recall, it's quite good. So this means that, they, let's say, if you take a top 100, you obtain a lot of good results, not necessarily on top, but at least from that, you know that the results are quite good. OK, so I'm not looking for precision. I don't want necessarily the images to be really the first or the second in top. I just want that in a particular window, let's say out of top 10, I want to get as many as possible correct location, even if they are at the end. because. The idea is that the user can also easily detect if this is correct or is wrong. 
Yeah, so what does, just to have a feeling about uh, best overlap, uh, like say 0.88 best overlap, so this is like the bicycle, this is at 88.4% overlap, this is about 87%, this is pretty reasonable. This is like for a person here, it's like 80%. Right, so if you have an overlap of about 80%, it's quite, quite reasonable as a bounding box. Okay, so if you do selective search, so you want to identify and find the location of the object. An object is found if the Pascal overlap score is larger than 50%. You have the ground truth, you have object hypothesis extracting from the hierarchy, yeah? What you also put in here, this is during the training, you can just obtain from some of these windows, they have reasonable scores, right? They, they may have very high scores. But you know the ground truth during training. So this means that what you do, you just take the difficult uh, negatives, yeah, so the one that overlap within uh, 20 to 50 percent, and I'm using them in training as negative examples. Right, so this is also interesting. It's not only that I'm using the object for the ground truth, but I'm also taking patches that are, for example, the red ones here. Okay, so they are negative, they are just part of the object. This is not a cow, it's just part of a cow. I'm using this as a negative example. I'm telling the algorithm that I'm not interested in getting this patch. learning algorithm, not only with positive example, but also with difficult negatives, right? So the negatives that are close to the, to the, to the boundary, right? So, the, so here are training examples, so this is an image, of course it's a Dutch image with two cows, so this is the ground truth. This is I'm using for training, and the red ones I'm using a negative example, so these are the, the difficult negatives that I'm using in the... Right, so there I'm training a, 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 a model, I'm doing, I'm getting false positives. I'm also there, put, put them to the um, a training example and I'm just retrain all, all around. Now some of the results for a Pascal VOC, so this is for 2010. Um, so I was also part of this team, so this was um, um, this paper, well that was a UVA team. Uh, we had the best results from nine out of 20 object classes. So we had the, the best results out of the ranking in there. Was working especially well for on non-rigid object classes. For example, we were very, very much better than many other places, there are many other algorithms on detecting cats. And so, because uh, apparently, so this, this was pretty good in, uh, in dealing with these non-rigid So this was, we, we, we were looking at, uh, so this is, uh, uh, I think this is the, the model, so this is the, the best, of, this is the mean average precision, what is the So this is the precision, but the algorithm was, was trying to, uh, uh, the, 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 was trying to maximize the recall. So you see that some of the classes like uh, bike, we were better, uh, this is uh, cat, as I said, so it's much better than the rest. This is sheep, this is TV, well, some of them were working good. Some, this is plant, for example, is much better. Some other, like chair, were not working very well. Okay, so the chair, we were one of the latest, so battle and some other kind of things. So again, it's, there is no single algorithm that works well for, or perfect for all the classes. Yeah, so if you use the quality of location, for our case, if you just use the same with considering also the ground truth, you see that the number of objective hypotheses increases, you more or less converge towards the same mean average precision. So this is what humans will do as well. Okay, so this, this selective search results in a small yet highly high quality set of potential object locations. Yes? You focus more on or recall than precision. Right, so I want to detect good examples, but not necessarily on top. Yeah? Uh, you are dealing with hierarchical grouping. Yes, to deal with object at multiple scales. And then you have multiple complementary strategies to deal with high variety of image conditions. Okay. So you can be very fast and being reasonable, being efficient, enable the use of more expensive features. That's also, so instead of putting the, the, the accent on, on, on features, you try to have a good hierarchical stuff in which gives you an efficient approach that will allow you to have more sophisticated features. Okay, now, 
we have some idea of the object location, but then, again, which location? Is this object location that we propose optimal? What, if I'm giving you these patches, can you tell what objects are in there? Well, some animals, but you, you wouldn't know what animals, right? Okay. What about now? Now it's pretty clear, right? So this is a cow, that's a horse, a dog, and another dog. But is this better than this? So which one I want? Okay, so there are three different levels. Right, so this is, this is now that you put the muscle in the context. So you want to say, so this means that I can get different locations, but I may have different of these windows that may be from the, uh, from the uh, best overlap point of view still good enough because even this one can have an average, an, an, an overlap higher than 50%, still being considered as a good detection, but you would agree that this one probably it's the best out of these three, right? So the next step was to try to see what was called most telling window. So which one of these windows is the one that is more important? It's telling me more about my object class. Yeah? So parts may be more discriminative because of pose changes. Yes, so if I have parts, then I can easily deal from the spatial point of view with changes in appearance and in pose. Because as long as I detect, for example, for a car, I detect the wheels, and I detect some, let's say, curvature somewhere, then this is quite significant for that particular object category. We had some, um, we had a paper, uh, what was that? I, I think it was 2004, 2005. It was a funny paper in which we were trying to learn what would be the discriminative parts to detect, to do object detection. And for example, for the car, so this is also kind of overfitting on the, on the um, on, on, on the data set. So for cars, we detected that the most informative part is the area, so the wheels by themselves and the shadow beneath the car, right? Because that one was the most invariant. So practically, if you take most of the cars, you know, in the way, in the, in the real life condition, the car will always have a shadow, so there will be some curvature, the wheels, and some shadow beneath the car, right? Because it's always in good condition. And that was, to, that was considered to be very discriminative. Of course, you would say, yeah, but this is not discriminative between a car and a truck. Uh, maybe not, but for sure, if I have to distinguish between a car and a cow, or many other things, that, that was learned to be discriminative. It's also, again, learning of the object, uh, learning of, the, it's kind of overfitting on the data set. But in most of the cases, you could do very well. Um, and also, if you take parts, so let's say parts of the windows, this would also be good in order to deal with occluded part <coughs> with, with, with occlusions, right? So here, well, I know, we know they are parts, but part of it is occluded, right? If I take this one out of the context, I show you only this, it may not be good enough, right? So if I'm still able to detect some features here, I can see that I get some of the parts, even if they are incomplete, I can still say, well, it's likely to be a car rather than a cow, because I don't detect any part that would belong to a cow class or a TV class or some other thing. <coughs> in, in other words, uh, in, in another example would be depending on what I'm going to get, for example, a larger window could help me detect objects when they are, let's say, many instances in the same image. Right? If I want to detect crowds, let's say bicycles, dogs, sheep, people, and so on, having a larger window may help me better than just having something around this one. So again, in other sense, compared to an individual object, a collection is, is both more easy to find and maybe more discriminative, because I have more information in there. Of course, here I'm assuming that I'm not detecting a single bicycle, but I just detect an image with bicycles. Okay, so that's again another assumption. Yeah, so the exact location, uh, exact lo lo localization is not optimal. So parts may be more discriminative for some classes. Interacting object may change pose and retraining typical appearance only for object parts, so you, you, you don't need to retrain for every single image. Occluded objects are hard to find when searching for complete objects, yes, and in crowded scenes, groups are more easy to recognize. Yeah, so the most telling windows may focus on object parts, complete objects, or object collections. So this is what we are looking for. 
Yeah, depending on the context, we try to detect these type of things. Yeah, so what you do, you start, you get, uh, so one solution would be to have the most dominant sliding window. Yes, I'm going all around, but then again, it, it yields like a million images or so, right? So solution search, uh, the selective search was what we proposed before. And this is what we used before, selective search using multiple complementary hierarchical segmentations. And now, I want to get some um, small set of class-independent locations, right? So, and I can capture parts, objects, and collections, right? So this is an example window generated by the method. You can get this bounding box, this one, this one, and so on. They are all representative, and I want to, de de to decide which one of these is more informative. Yeah, so in the, in the previous framework, it was like you have a descriptor extraction, let's say shift or whatever, you do the visual word assignment, as I showed you with a bag of words. Then in the training, you use complete image, you train an SVM model, uh, and then you do classification here. Yeah? Then for the most telling window here, instead of just using the entire image, I'm using only the selective search locations. And on top of that, I'm also adding the extra negatives, right? So again, I'm using some negatives in order to boost my, uh, uh, my detection. Some examples, so these are positive examples. So this is a positive example for cars. So you get a, a good bounding box. This is you get the bounding box of a collection. These ones are considered to be, let's say, hard negatives. That they are used as hard negative in the image. Um, here, it doesn't change much. Uh, here, the only difference is that the hard negatives are more diverse than before. Yeah, so this is some for the most telling window. And then in this case, um, it's, um, you have a subtle difference in the training and you have significant difference in the final results, right? Of course, it would be better to also obtain new positive example in the retraining loop. In some way, it would be good if, if I'm doing this retraining to tell that maybe these ones are still positive and I'm doing the retraining, some, some kind of um, automatic annotation of the images, but that's not necessarily easy. Okay, some implementation details, so you can get a pixel-wise sampling, so here you can just get patches around the pixel. You can, uh, you can use some color shift, there are different type of implementations. You can use the k-means for visual vocabulary, the hard assignments, well, you can store the visual images and so on. So these are all tricks in order to make it, uh, to make it faster. Some results. Uh, well, so this is comparable uh, with the top scores. So this is again for Pascal VOC. Um, if you put context, if you just use uh, not the whole image, but its most telling window, again, you can obtain for most of the classes you obtain significant results, not for everything. For example, for bird, it doesn't help much. For boat, it doesn't work because m many of these classes, as I said, the boat and, and bird, the context is more important than the object itself. As I said, so most of the boats are on water, most of the birds are on the sky. So they are detecting, the, so having a location around the bird doesn't really help much on, on detecting the bird category. So there you do well if you just get the larger part in which you get the sky. So if you get, for example, um, in this way, for the bird, you detect holes in the sky. And the hole in the sky would be a bird. Okay? Or you detect holes in the water. So if you get the water scene and we have a hole, there what can you see? You would say a boat. Fine. So that's why the approach, the, the most telling window doesn't help much in there. For m many other um, objects, Again, for the plane, it's still, still the same here. The difference is not much, but it's still there. If you, if you just get a better object localization for most of the classes, you obtain much better results. If you use our localization, so this is on top of uh, what was a bag of words, you already obtain better results. Still not at the level of the bag of words plus most telling window. And then if you use part-bay localization, you obtain also not so good results. So the idea would be to have all these approaches together and then you do the combination, right? So if you just combine them, yes, with localization, then you can obtain even better results, right? So instead of just saying, on one hand, I'm looking at the most telling windows. On the other hand, I'm looking at the context. 
For some topic categories, one is better than the other. So why not just using all of them and then you combine them at the end? And if you do that, you obtain significant results for, for practically all the classes. In some cases, for example, like with the bird, you obtain a significant improvement here. Yeah, so some of the, uh, so it means that every single part of the system will bring you some information. Maybe by themselves, they will not work that well. Probably the most telling window works better. But then, if you use complementary information coming from the other information, then you can obtain much better results, right? So again, there is no single solution, but if you just have several solutions, you put them together, you can obtain uh, better results. Okay, so, so this is visualizing the most telling window. So, uh, so this is a window of the top ranked images. So this is for, um, so this is a high ranked positive. So this is for uh, airplane pretty reasonable, but you can see you also get information about crowded, so several instances of the, of the airplane. Uh, this is a highly ranked negatives. So this one, for example, here may look like an airplane, but is rejected, is considered as being an, um, a negative. Yeah, so this, it's not too bad actually, if you think about it, this could be an airplane to some degree. This is for bicycles. So again, you get parts, you get entire bicycle, you can get uh, many instances of the object dropped from the image. This is a highly negative. So also here, this may look like a bicycle if you think about it, right? So you have a big wheel, practically many of them, and they are still rejected. Well, this a bit, a bit less, but still you have the texture that may look like the bicycle. Also here you have some curvature. This one is quite, quite difficult because it's, uh, um, it's, uh, you, you have a motorbike, and so on. This is for cats. Pretty reasonable, I would say. Yeah, so this is a um, high rank positives. This is a high rank negative. Most of them will be kind of images of dogs, right? So sometimes dogs and cats can be, uh, especially some particular viewpoints, you may have troubles to, to do well, to well detect, good, good detection. This is for cows. Right, so again, pretty reasonable. Most of the cases, the cows are kind of coming into groups, so you have many instances. This is example of high rank negatives. So again, you have many other animals that are considered. So you don't get a high rank negative like a car because it's far away from the cow class, for example. And this is um, uh, motorbikes. So you will see here in the, in the highly rank negative, so the difficult negative, so this is the location that is, um, that's why this is number, it means the location. Um, here you get the class that are neighboring classes, right? So you get something with wheels, so if it's a car, you get a bicycle, other kind of things. Yeah, so this is for, for people. So here in general, for people it works pretty good. So again, person detection, especially if you use like hawks and other kind of things, you will see that the higher negative are just coming from the, you know, position 137 and so on, so it's kind of far away. So this one are pretty, pretty not very much like, like people. Okay, so let's say what you do out of this with uh, most telling window. So this is the window that is the most discriminative for classifying the presence of a particular object. Yeah, so you learn this one using um, positive samples and the negative ones. So this part can be an object part in the most telling window, can be the whole object or can be an object collection. In other words here, we just use three different approaches, right, so you could say, we combine parts, like many other people were using parts to detect objects. We combine whole objects in which we try to get at least as good as possible the bounding box on or the object collection. And depending on the class, depending on instances, one of these would be better. So if you just combine them, you are guaranteed to obtain the best results. Yeah? So probably this was uh, one of the things that was the first time that the window within the image yields better results by itself than the whole image. Yeah. So this most telling window works better than exact localization. And if I'm trying to get exact localization, I may have some mistake because I get a lot of false positives. Right? Um, of course, sometimes you get some suboptimal uh, uh, results and this uh, suboptimal positive window suggests room for improvement. So, <coughs> if you do selective search together with, uh, with this uh, most telling window, you can obtain powerful local value of words, and there is a class independent part, so also in collection. 
This is something that it's working very well together. Okay, um, so this was, let's say, now we have, in the recipe, we have a way to detect object location. Okay, so now we'll be looking at how to detect things. Right, so we have a recipe of detecting reasonable well with reasonable accuracy things. But now, we just said that the things by itself may not be enough. I want to put the things in the context. And I will go back to what was uh, the, um, the satellite image example in which I'm trying to say, well, I have a very good detector to detect cars. But I want to say, how can I enhance the car detector, right, the mean average precision in some sense, by knowing, by introducing some relationship with what the things I do. Right? So this would be the point. In other words, I may have relationship, I say, well, cars are always on the road. Uh, I don't know, birds are in the sky, uh, cars are not on the building, you know, this kind of thing. So I'm trying to put together things and stuff. Okay? So if I have the satellite detection, so these are detecting what I have. So, well, so um, uh, green are the one with um, the, the, the true positive, red are, have a high detection score as good as this one, but these are false positives, right? And this is, this is at the ground, so I can tell that these are not cars, even if they look like cars. From this particular example, from the appearance point of view, I cannot distinguish between them, right? They are all, especially from the top, all the cars or all these structures on top of the building, they look very much similar. So this part may be a car, unless I know what is in there. Okay? So, the task, as I said, it's identify all cars in the satellite image. And the idea is that surrounding context adds information to the local window detector. Yeah? So the prior is the detector only, in my case, right? So what is the change of getting a car versus no car? Then I'm adding the region labels. How to do that? Well, I'm doing some sort of segmentation in base of the statistics. I can tell that this is roads, these are houses, I may have streets, I may have other kinds of things. And then these two together will create a procedure. And that's what, we, what is called the TAS model, so the things and stuff model. And this is exactly what we are going to discuss in the next uh, few minutes. Yeah, so the error analysis, so if I'm just doing in my training set, I'm doing an error analysis, I can easily say, well, the true positives are the ones that are in the context, so cars are on the road, while the false positives are out of context. Right, so that's why they are false positives, because they, are, they don't fit my assumption, my intuition. Right? As I said, I mean, again, this is, this is a statistical analysis. I may have one of these, maybe a car. If somebody puts a car on top of the building, I'm going to miss that stuff because it's out of the context. But on the other hand, how many of you are very interested in detecting cars on top of the building? Well, it's completely, it's kind of irrelevant query, right? So I, even if I know it's a car, I may not care it's a car. Okay? Since I'm doing statistical analysis, I'm going to lose that one because I'm saying that car, it's out of the context. We look. It looks like a car, it is a car, but I know it's out of the context, so it cannot be a car there. I'm just ignoring it. What you said indeed, so the having ab abnormal events, that's, that's quite important, yes, because it's kind of out of the context. <coughs> <coughs> so in order to do this analysis, we need to look outside the bounding box. So while I said before, when we were looking at the object detection, we were looking inside the bounding box because we wanted to detect precisely the object and the localization. Now we try to detect, I'm saying this is a car, not because it looks like, not only because it looks like the car, but it's also because the surroundings look like roads, these are houses and so on. Right, so I'm looking now at both together. So what kind of context I can have? 
I can have the seen and seen content, right? So I can look at the gist. This is what Antonio Toralba was doing, right? If I do some segmentation of this object, right? If, I, if, if it looks like this, looks pretty bad, right? I would say here in this scene, cars are likely, yeah, because it's a scene of a, of a city, and the keyword is unlikely, even if this may look like, like a keyword. Okay, so this is the contest between the scene. If, if I have a cityscape, it's unlikely that in the TV I'm going to have an image of a keyword. But it's likely that I'm going to get cars and pedestrian and other kinds of things. So this is a, the scene scene context. Again, putting the objects in the, in the scene context. Then if you can have the stuff stuff context. Right, so this is again, if I just make a hierarchy between building, grass, trees, cows, and sky, I can just detect which ones are enhancing each other, right? So for example, a building, if I say building and sky, so the sky is always or seems to be on top of the building, right? So this is the white detecting on top of the stuff. Uh, while cow, I don't have any good response. I don't have many images with cows and buildings, and so on, right? So you can detect uh, sky and buildings again, so this is a building on top, so this is building and uh, stuff is here. If I have sky and grass, so this is grass and sky, again, grass is on this low, uh, sky is high, and so on. Right, so this is a stuff and stuff thing. So I'm having different categories, and then how do I label the image? Well, I just say, well, usually in most of the pictures that I get, the sky is on top. So if there is anything blue is at the top of there, it's likely to be sky. And then I can just do it. So there are many works on this, not only this, but you can also detect Okay, for example, like type of scenes. So for example, um, you can have kind of, um, if you just look at images, so you, can, you can try to look at the vanishing point and you can tell, well, this is different type of cityscape, different type of images, different viewpoints. So you can categorize these scenes. And then finally you have sing and sing. What does it mean? It means that you detect objects like person, wreck and ball, and whatever you have there, and then, just do, if you limit to this, this can be a lemon, right? So it looks like a lemon, it's a yellow stuff. But then, of course, what would the lemon do with the tennis racket or the tennis court? So then, based on that, again, looking at different objects, you say, that cannot be a lemon. Even if my detector may say it's a lemon. Of course, it's a tennis ball, and so on. Okay, so again, putting, so this is looking at the sink and sink stuff. So I'm having different objects, and I'm saying, if I put, if I have a racket, a tennis racket, and I have some yellow stuff around that may look like a lemon, that one must be a tennis ball. Of course, again, you can have instances in which you have kind of, you know, that nature in which you have photos of tennis rackets and lemons, but those are not available because functionally it will not work for what it is. Okay, so now for the stuff and things stuff and things uh, part, we want to, to be based on spatial relationships. Yeah? And the intuition is like cars drive on roads, cows graze on grass, boats sail on water. Okay, you say, yeah, but this is kind of evident, it's kind of too simple. Maybe, but our most of our world, most of our images, most of the things are based on this common sense. Okay? Of course you can say, well, I may have an example of a car driving on grass. Fine, but I mean, how many, if you just look at, I don't know, a Google image, finding a car driving on grass, it's really a very, very tiny, uh, well, set of all the images of cars. Most of the cars will be on roads. So here, what we are looking at, trying to detect this kind of common sense location. Okay, so what you do, you just detect, for example, uh, trees based on color, based on texture, based on things. And here you can say, well, there are no cars, especially in this case, if you know it's a, it's a satellite type of image, right? It's very unlikely to, to see a car on top of the trees. The same, uh, houses, you may have the relation say, well, the cars are nearby. They may not be, again, I'm not saying that this is a car, but if I detect houses, I may say, I may enhance the fact that nearby could be some cars. If I have the road, I'm saying the cars are here on the road. So again, these are some kind of, I'm changing the priors so that the detector will work better. Okay, so the goal is to do it in an unsupervised way. Okay, so now with the thing and stuff model, I'm going to have a little bit of mathematics in here, but I'm, 
I'm going to stay at the high level and then we can take the break. So, um, <coughs> for the detection, what we do, we just do over detection first. Okay, why do we do over detection? In other words, I want to detect cars, but I may detect also some other things. So the reason for that is in the first stage, I may not want to lose any instance of cars. I may get a lot of false positives, fine, I can prove them in the next stage, but I don't want to lose a detector of the car, because if I'm losing it at this moment, then it would be practically impossible to recover after that. Right? So now it's, it's similar to an over-segmentation, if you want. Okay, so each candidate had a detector score, so I'm getting something like this. Okay, it looks pretty bad. But now the goal is to kind of go through all these detection and try to, to clean them up. Okay, so let's see from the statistical point of view how do we do this. So the candidate detection are image windows, WI, which are assigned a score. Yes? I'm having a Boolean random variable that will tell me if there is a presence, the absence of the target class in the window I. Yeah, so in other words, this Boolean variable, the TI, it will tell me if this is, um, if this is a car or not. Yeah, so this is, this is something that I want to model. Then the thing model will get the conditional probability from the window features to probability that the window contains your object. Yeah, so I have the image Y, and I'm just detecting this variable, and this could be the probability. In this case, it's an exponential, but you can use, uh, you can, you can use many other uh, type of detectors. Okay, so this is, again, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm computing the, the conditional probability of um, detecting this Boolean variable given the window. So what's the probability of having the car given that particular appearance of the window? It's a very simple uh, Bayesian network if you want in here. Okay? Now for the stuff, we do the same type of things, right? So the segment the image into regions, so you have the core superpixels. Yeah, so you get something like this. Then, for each region, extract color and texture features. So this is a vector fj. Yeah, so this is something that is observed, uh, because I'm getting from the image. And then I'm getting a generative model in which each region has an hidden class label si, in which this is one of the classes that I have. It's hidden because I cannot observe it. I mean, based on the, by the feature that I'm getting, I can say this is road, this is uh, trees, this are other kind of things, right? And so the stuff model, I'm, I want to get this uh, joint probability of the classes and the feature that I get, which I put the Bayesian rule, I'm making to this one. Yeah, so this is the uh, probability, this is the prior, and this is the conditional probability. And I can say that this is more like a Gaussian. Right? I can try to build some Gaussian in which, based on the training data, I'm trying to, to learn the mean and the sigma of the class for each of the classes. This is standard approach. So I'm getting this SJ which is hidden, <coughs> <coughs> and uh, I'm observing the FJ. It's again in the, in the um, a graphical model, this is uh, one of the representations. Now I want to put also the relationships, right? So I want to have descriptive relation like near, above, in front of, and so on, yeah? So you have a set of air possible relationships, right? I have air IJK. So if detection i and reason j have relation k, right? So here I'm putting um, the detection window, the region, what I'm having, so the class, the region, and the relation. Yeah, so then I'm having again in the, in the um, graphical model, I'm, I'm obtaining, I'm, I'm, I'm having this uh, hidden variable, I'm observing this relationship. Okay, so this is the uh, generic stuff that we do. Then I will show you into details, how do you really learn these kind of things? Yeah, so example would be R1, yeah, so this, uh, the T1, you have S10, and in it's equal to one. So in other words, so this car, it's in the road, it's equal to one, right? So the cars are on top of the road. Okay, so now if you put all this together, you obtain, this is the supervised set. Yeah, so this is supervised in training set. I'm doing, I'm doing the detectors. Uh, these are the image window, what I'm obtaining with the relationships. This is um, the part of the region features, right? So they are all connected in this particular way. So this is, let's say, let's say the generic model in which I'm connecting um, windows with uh, features. 
And then if I'm, I'm, rolling, I'm rolling this model, it will look something like this, right? If I have the, these are the candidate windows, these are um, the part of the image regions, and then if I just connect all of them, I can say, well, uh, this T1, it's, it's uh, left of uh, S1, and so on, right? So I can, I can, if I have that model, I can unwrap it, and I can obtain something similar to this. Okay? Now, how do we learn these parameters, right? Because this is quite a complex model. So if we assume we know the relationships. Now, so let's say at the beginning we fix the relationships. Yeah. So I mean, I, I'm assuming here that I'm already having a detector. So I'm, I'm assuming that I, I have a hard detector. So I already have the, the window that, let's say, the most selling window will be. Okay, so I have a detector for the car. In this case, so this is the T1 I already had. So whatever feature, whatever detector you may have. Okay, so it doesn't matter much. Right, so um, SJ, this one is hidden. Yeah, because I don't know exactly how to, to get it. It's always hidden. And then I'm doing an expectation maximization part, right? So I'm trying to say, well, I'm observing this. I need to get the relationship. So it's kind of chicken and net problem. So I need to kind of do some, some looping in there. OK, so this is learn some satellite clusters. So this is, for example, um, cluster for, um, uh, so this is um, vegetation part of things. So in this cluster, the car being car is very low, the probability. Here I'm having patches of, of roads, and here again the probability is much higher, and so on. Yeah, so this is depending on the, the stuff you get. So this is, this, this is really road parts, cluster that we get from there. So this is a super pixels. Again, the probability is very high. While here again, vegetation, you get 0 0.04. So this kind of things you can do. Yeah, so this is just a zoom in, and you can get patches. So this is more like likely that I can get cars in here. This is very unlikely that I'm going to get a car in here. Okay? So which relationship you use? Well, that's one of the problems. So this could be candidate in the region, closer, closer to that, two bounding boxes, and so on. Of course, you would say, yeah, but this is silly. I mean, how am I going to come up with this relationship? It's not, it's not that somebody, of course, in some cases, it may be clear. Some other cases may not be very clear. So what you want to do, you want to learn them from the data. Okay, so these relationships. Right? Because otherwise, you would avoid overfitting. You will learn that always things will happen in that particular context. OK, so, so far, we assume a known set of relationships. Yes, but different data may require different type of contextual relationship. Right? So we want to learn which one to use. So the pr approach is kind of simple. Well, let's say mathematical is not so simple. But so you define a large set of C candidate relationships. Let's say all the ones that you want. Let's say very, very, you can be exhaustive here. You can use as many as you want. Then you, so, you search through this C for the subset of the active ones. So in your particular context, for, let's say cars and roads and so on, you just take the ones that are active from your training data. So you, you, uh, if a relationship is in inactive, you just remove the edge from the TI and SJ to this RIK variable. I'm going to show you in the next slides. And if you do that, you can formulate um, our search and error the structure learning problem. So what I'm doing, I'm doing there, I'm learning the structure of my words. So I have uh, detectors of the object, I have detector of the region, and then I'm learning from the data which one of these relationships are active in my training data. Yeah, so if I do this, this is the unwrap model, I can just um, um, learn that, for example, these two are not active, right? I don't have these relationships, so I eliminate it from the model. And I'm iterating based on my training data. Yeah? So, um, well, you kind of, so this is the structure EM. So you learn the parameter, detect, decide which, which uh, edges to, to toggle. And then when you have this loss function, you require the inference and you obtain better results than just using the standard one. This is some example of the algorithm. I'm not going to, uh, to go into detail. So this is the standard EM with structured learning. So in the, um, a little bit about the inference, and I will finish in the next five minutes. You find the probability that each window contains the object. This is more like a condition probability. So this is a T given the, the, um, the relationship, the windows, and the F part. So this is the features from the, from the stuff. Um, you put, this is equal to, especially if you single, single it out on, on S, you obtain these things. And then you solve the importance problem using this 
uh, Monte Carlo approach. Right? Again, I'm not going into, into details. Um, I'll give you the reference to, uh, to, to, the, to that work. This is a standard approach for machine learning. Well, this is again uh, the, the, the GIP sampling. You just, just do some iteration on the S and then it's sample to the T according to the stuff. Again, you have to do it correctly in order to avoid overfitting. It's kind of simulating annealing here that you want to do. Again, I'm not going into details. If you are interested, again, it's, uh, it's a lot of mathematics in there. Let me show you some results. So in this particular case, uh, the features that we use were um, uh, the bound, these were the edge fragments. So getting, let's say, part of the um, object. It's a weak detector. Yeah, so we were using boosting for that. Then we were using the hot, hot detector for, um, uh, let's say this is similar for the pedestrian, so this is a feature vector X, and we use the SVM classifier. This is a standard detector, but can be used anything else that you, you want to get in there. So some results, if you're just doing only the detector only, of course you obtain these results, as I showed you before. This is the posterior labels, and these are um, the detections. So now you can see that many of them have been cleaned out, you still have a little bit of false positives in here. Some of them, but most of them are on the road. And most of these false positives are kind of, let's say, sort of shadows, so, so this kind of, so like, like, like this part here, right? It's, it's a shadow of some particular window, looks like a car, it could be a car. So it makes, makes sense in some way. Yeah, so if you do, if you use a base detector, so only the detector, if you use a task model, you obtain some kind of 10% improvement in recall. Which is, which is quite, uh, quite significant. Some examples. So these are, again, cows. Uh, these are parts of the object. This is, again, um, this is, uh, this is uh, some of the things will say that this is also a cow, which is pretty bad, of course. Um, what to discover the context, so here, uh, the bicycle detector is enhanced by the fact that here I'm detecting patches that are reporting to be road and so, right? So I'm detecting that this one is a bicycle because I'm also detecting supporting elements that these are uh, road patches, the same also here. And uh, well, the same here, this is correct, so I'm getting road, so this is a bicycle. Here, the detection is this one. Again, I'm getting some support from here, and then there is some kind of structure in here that may, may look like a bicycle, so this is a false, so this is an error of the image, of the, um, of the method, right? So I want to discover the true positive, while the other one I want to remove the, the, the false positives. So then again, results on this, and you can obtain, you can see for many of the results, so this is a standard hog approach, so this is the detector only. This is the base detector, so without using the, um, the, the, the thing and stuff model, and you see it's quite a significant difference for many people. For the pedestrian, again, the hog by itself, it's a pedestrian detector uh, feature, and this one, you see, there is practically no improvement. So it's, it's working very well for, for, for people. While for any other things, especially where the context is important, it's working much better. The same for cows and for uh, sheep. Well, these are some numbers. Again, it's just too low. Let's see. OK, so just to finish with this, and then we can take the break. So the detector can benefit from context. This sync and stuff model capture an important type of context. Yes, can improve any sliding window selective search detector using this task. And the task model can interpret it and matches our intuition. Again, so the fact that detection of objects are just detecting in the context. So I'm detecting cars because I detect roads nearby or houses nearby, and so on. Of course, this may not necessarily solve, solve the problem always because I may get uh, some post positive the example was from the satellite image, for example, if you get shadows and so on. If I know it's a, it's, a, it's a road there, I get some kind of some kind of rectangle that may look like a car, I would say it's a car. I, I, there is no other way I could say that's not a car. It, it is the right context. It has the shape of a car, it may have some structure in there, so it should be a car. It may not be, but again, in most of the cases, it's, it's re working reasonably. Okay, so um, let's take a break now, and then I will continue a little bit very fast through, um, uh, I will go a little bit about the deep learning, because it's, as I said, it's quite important. And then I'm going to show you some specific results regarding to the five questions that I put, some, some instances on how do we solve the stuff, and uh, again, some machine learning things. I, I have only some basic equation about optimization, 
if you are interested in how to really solve that optimization, you can look at our papers. I mean, my, I had a Chinese student, he had pages and pages of equation and how to solve things and how to do matrix stuff. So uh, again, I'm not going to, to go into details here. Okay, so let's take a break. Okay, so um, what I was presenting so far was, let's say, what is called the traditional approach. I mean, it's not necessarily true in the sense that, that uh, well, I think really state of the art until like uh, two, 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 not year, two years ago. Now, especially for the recognition, last uh, Pascal DOC challenge, especially for the image analysis, they show that deep learning approaches are working better just than the, the approaches that I was, uh, I was presenting before. Okay, so in the traditional recognition approach, this is what I was also presenting in the first part, you get input data for the pixel of the image, you have a feature representation, in most of the cases they are handcrafted in the sense that you have to choose a feature that you want to get. Could be shift, could be hop, could be many other things. I will show you after that that you can also do a little bit of feature selection, you can also do a little bit of other things, but they are still kind of data driven. And then you do you have a learning algorithm, so ATM or whatever you want to do. And then you obtain your object with the texture classification. Right? So they represent I'm, I, I decided to, to show you some of the, let's say, the main um, principle of, of this deep learning without going into details. Um, some of my, my guys are also working on deep learning, so we are also interested in, in doing this. And uh, practically, now the solution is to kind of put, make a hybrid approach of this, in the sense of, um, it's true that in the deep learning approach you can, you can input the, the image data, like the pixels. But it has been shown that, for example, if you input Selective window, let's say, the telling window, not the thing, then it doesn't matter. But even there, if you use better features for the deep learning, the, out, the outcome is quite, uh, it's quite significantly good.
Okay. So these are some of the examples. So, so the feature that we can have could be the image gradient go to 60. Then you can get some, some different features extracted from different geographies. You can have some spin images and so on, texture and so on, so right? So many other type of features that, that have been proposed. So SERP, MSR, MVP, and so on. And then the features are keys to the recent progress in recognition, okay? And there is a multitude of hand design features which are currently in use, right? And then the question will be what would be next? So how do we really try to deal with many of these features and try to, to be able to obtain a good result? So this is, this, is, this is the motivation of proposing a deep architecture, right? So we want to obtain better classifier, we want to, to build better features. Okay, so these are some examples, so this is a hog, these are some hierarchical features, uh, this was a winner of the Pascal 2010 classification competition and so on, okay? So what limits uh, the current performance, and this is, this is quite an interesting paper, this was the CDPR 2010, in which they were uh, having this, static, this uh, classical pipeline like I had before, and then what they were doing, they would replace one of these components with a human and just show what, what is the influence of this part, right? So if you have the part, if you have the fashion model, so there's, there's a relationship between the stuff, and this is a, a non-maximum separation in some sort of uh, context that you obtain from, uh, from the image part. So this is, this is a parts part. So if you just um, consider what is the weight of each of these components, practically this is for area data set, this is for data set, this is the standard of calculus. So the parts representation seems to be the most informative one. Um, <coughs> so uh, if you remove, so, so, so if you, if, if you remove the, the parts, part, uh, parts part with the human, so the human will indicate the part. So there you can see a big difference in uh, um, improvement in the average precision. Uh, if you do the spatial model, it's quite good actually. So the, 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 um, the spatial uh, distribution of the parts the automatic one is quite okay, so if you replace it with a human, practically you don't know improvement, you can even get uh, worse. And then uh, the context, again, if you provide the right context, you obtain the good image. So the analysis of this part was, uh, of this paper was to see which are the critical parts into the pipeline. So if that one will be perfect, so assuming that the human will do the perfect result, uh, would this be the, what would be the influence at the end of the pipeline? So they found out that indeed the parts part is quite important and critical and then the context. Um, they also show that uh, there are different types of features that you can try to obtain to obtain better results. So these are some mid-level cues, like continuation of line, for example, other than you, so on, or object parts. Right? Um, so the main problem is here with the parts. So I'm, I'm going into this because of the parts, the expression of the parts was shown to be the most influential in the end. And then you could say, well, the problem with these parts is they're difficult to handle. Right? And then you would want to learn them in a better way. Okay, so this is quite important. Sorry, but mid-level you mean that they are more No, mid-level means that they are more than just a bunch of, uh, of pixels. So mid-level means that they are something that they have some structure, so they, they represent something. They may not be interpreted for necessarily like, you know, in, in a segmentation stuff, but they represent some, something that is unique in some way. Right, so by talking to parts, you mean that there's a set of parts and that there's a set of Here you have a set of here, you consider only parts. I understand this is parts, there is a set of yes. eye. So you understand that it's an eye because it looks like some part of a particular object. Not necessarily, you, you don't have semantics there. Yeah, right, you understand it's an eye or not? No, I mean, you, you understand that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a patch that is distinctive for that particular object. Uh, right, right. So I don't know to call it an eye, so I cannot call it an eye because I don't know the name for that. Right, because you don't have a tag. Okay. Exactly, I don't have a tag, but I know that it's something distinctive. Okay, so the idea is that now to learn a hierarchy of things, right? So you, you, you move from all the way from the pixel to classifier, and then one layer extracts features from output of the previous layer. So then if you do this kind of thing, so you have different levels in which each level will represent some of these features, some of these things, then you can obtain uh, a good classifier, right? And if you train all layers jointly, then you can obtain better results. So this is exactly
abstract this idea behind the deep learning part. Right? So I have different layers. Each layer is meant to represent particular type of features. Some will represent texture, some will represent different scales, some will represent color features, some will represent combination of text points. In some way, it is um, inspired, the kind of biological inspired. So this is exactly what we have in the brain. So rather than we have some features in the D1, in the, in the, in the visual cortex in which um, are very simple, like line and, uh, and let's say circular things and so on. And then we have some higher level features that are kind of combination of things and so on. So the idea of this bit structure was exactly to, to follow this particular thing. So you have some specialized layers that are supposed to capture some of these things. Okay? So you can learn useful um, and uh, useful high level features from images. Yeah, so you can have, let's say, the feature representation. The third layer will be object, in this case, the face. The second layer will be object part. Again, I don't know if it's an eye or whatever it is, I just know that it's something you see. And we characterize this object. Third layer, so this is again the low level stuff, you can get edges. Right? So each part may be combined of this type of edges. Right? And then the lower level will be the feature. So, in other words, when you do a deep learning representation, you can obtain a different level. You go from the picture, from the input, and you obtain intermediate representation until you hope to get the output you object part. Yeah? So you can fill in the representation gap in the recognition, into the, this, this uh, deep learning representation. So you can hope to obtain better performance, and you can also hope to, to be generalizable to other domains, right? So to Kinect data, to 3D data, to video, to music, vector stuff, and so on. Um, so the problem with the feature computation time is this, you can have thousands of features now are regularly used and it's getting pro a prohibitive for the large data set, right? So you can get tens of seconds per image, which takes quite a lot of time. Has anyone ever done any experimental analysis with this? Yeah. Like yeah. There, there, no, there are exponential rather than polynomial, yeah. No, well, most of, well, people, what they do from the feature analysis is kind of exponential. Then what you try to do, you do feature selection, you do try to think, and you do, you try to, I'm going to talk a little bit later, we try to have sparse models. And in that case, so you just take a huge matrix, you, you just do the, 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 the decomposition in which you try to get a, a smaller, uh, a smaller representation. It still works theoretically. Yeah. Okay, so the approaches that you can get for learning the feature, so it'll be supervised. These are some of the, um, approaches, so end-to-end -end learning and deep architecture with backpropagation, which is again the standard approach, works well when um, you have amount of label, uh, of the amount of labeling uh, of labels is large. It will not work very well if you don't have enough labeling. So this is, this is one of the, the problems for deep learning. You need to get a lot of label data, okay? The structure of the method, of the model is very important, so the combinational structure is extremely important here in order to work fine. And there are already some recipes. I will show you in the uh, next slide. There is a standard Pizetsky architecture. Now there are a few variants of that, but usually most of the people will just start with that and then you do some small variation. And then in the unsupervised learning, you learn the statistical structure on dependency of the data from unlabeled data. So again, you use, you have a few labeled data, you have a bulk of unlabeled data, and you can use unlabeled data to kind of learn the structure of the labeled data, right? So in some sense, the differences in this unsupervised stuff is that I don't know uh, the labels of the things, but I can cluster them together and then saying that they are together means that I can extract some, some features that are common for all of them. Yeah? Um, well, this is a layer-wide training, so I have to learn for each, each, each single layer, and then useful when the amount of label is not, is not very large. So this is the same as supervised learning. So why is there this relation to size? Why is this No, no, no. So the no. So so when you when you do supervise, since since uh, the, the the deep learning architecture has a lot of parameters to learn, you need to get a lot of data. If you don't have a lot of data, then it's better to use unsupervised or semi-supervised because then at least you use the bulk of. Yeah, so this was the first architecture. So this was proposed by Jan Le Kuhn in uh, 89. So now Jan Le Kuhn is in uh, Facebook, he's doing all this kind of thing. Um, actually, it's a long story about this paper. Actually, it was rejected by, uh, by CDPR. Uh, it, was, it was kind of, he, he, he then uh, well, promised kind of 
probably that you will never call this from CDPR. Now, in the last year, that's not true because now it's becoming very popular. It's quite famous for this kind of thing, right? So, so he, he proposes a detection with different convolutions, subsampling, uh, and so on. In that time, he was using four digits recognition for, for different reasons. First of all, because the images were simpler. In that, in that case, in 1890, he used available uh, computational, uh, uh, well, com com um, computational power that he had in that time. Um, and then, okay, so all the things are reasonable, simple, but the idea is quite, uh, quite, quite novel. And then, so, so from, from 89, practically only, it took about 20 years until uh, people kind of realized the power of this type of things and now in implemented in practice. But the main architecture, the standard one, is very, very similar. It's following quite a lot of the, um, the, um, the structure that, that Jan LeCun was, uh, was, propo was uh, proposing. Yes, I will go now through, through all of them to see what they do. So what you have, you have a feature. What do you mean by convolution? Well, it's, it's just uh, practically what you do. You just, you just uh, do the standard uh, convolution function. If you have a filter in which uh, you uh, do the convolution with the filter. And so you go from the input, input image, you go to the convolution stuff. I'm going to, to go through all of them in the next slide. You have some non-linearity in there in order to avoid the repeating to other things. You do pooling, again, again for overfitting, and then you arrive at feature max. Uh, and this is as a fit forward to convolve the input. It's not linearity, so it's rectified linear, and then you do some local uh, max tuning and so on. So you, you train convolutional filters by backpropagation uh, classification error. So then you compute the classification error, you do the backpropagation, and then you do the, the convolution again. <coughs> so components of each layer. Um, so, filter with dictionary, right? So this is, uh, you, you have a dictionary learning and then you do some, some filter with that. You do the special feature stuff, so you do pulling out of that and then you do normalization between uh, filter responses. This is the output filter. So this is more or less what, uh, what it does from the functional point of view. So the filters, um, so the dependency are local, right? So you get this type of features. Right? You have this filter and then you do convolution in that part. In other words, it's similar to, so we have a filter like this. Yeah, so this is, uh, well, it's sort of a Gabor filter. Could be a Gaussian, but they use Gabor filter for that. And then you just do a feature map based on that. So you do, uh, you have uh, translation, uh, dependencies are local, translation is equivalent, equi equivariant, and then you have the strike filter weight, right? We have two parameters. And then you have different strikes. It's uh, again a parameter, it could be faster, but you use less. Stay around the different filters. So you obtain this kind of inputs. Different layers. In other words, this is again inspired, this biologically inspired. So in our representation of the images, we have again this type of thing. So the good thing about this filtering is that you can eliminate a lot of details. So here what you what you get, you get some very directional details depending on the filter on edges and this type of things, right? So again you eliminate a lot of background, a lot of other information. So again, you add the nonlinear stuff. Uh, well, why? Because so, so these are some of the, the things that um, uh, the, the functions that are, are imposed in there. And then, well, you can have the rectify linear if you want. So this is simplify the backpropagation, makes learning faster, avoid saturation issues. So these are more, some, of, some of the things that people apply there. Um, pooling, uh, again, you don't obtain all the features here. But so you can do a max pooling and do a sum around there. Uh, you have non-overlapping, overlapping region. Overlapping again, these are some kind of uh, parameters how you do. So here you do this pooling to avoid, you don't need to get all the information of the images, but you just need to get part of it. So it's again, it's kind of sort of localization type of things. And then you do some normalization. So you do some contrast normalization. So you want to do some sort of to be uh, illumination independent. around. Yeah, so this is the standard architecture. So this is uh, uh, right now, so you see, so Lecun, it was the same model as Lecun from 98. Now it's, uh, we talk about this 2012, so it's quite like 20 year, four years after that. Um, you have a, bit, a bigger model, so now of course we have better, better computation, so you can go up to, up to eight layers. You have more data, right? So now you can deal with millions of images versus 
you to you know thousands as my code had in that time. Um, quite important is to have this GPU implementation. Right? So now many people, like also my group, many other groups have this kind of uh, standard GPUs, very standard, uh, very GPUs architecture, very uh, powerful GPU architecture. So uh, we receive from NVIDIA uh, the Tesla cards. It's, it's quite uh, quite powerful. So we do everything on GPU because otherwise it would take too long. And you have better regularization, so you have the dropout stuff. But for the rest, it's very similar uh, to, to what Lecun has. So you have seven hidden layers, 650,000 neurons, 60 million parameters. I think it's a thing depending on millions. Maybe, maybe now, or maybe, maybe the newer one, maybe the unit is smaller, because now there are some, some data sets which are larger. But in this time, in 2012, I think uh, Alec was using this device for like a million. And then in that time, it took two GPUs for a week, so just to, 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 to do the training. Now uh, there are, again, faster analysis, so you can do it faster, you can do it less, uh, um, less precise and so on, but the idea is that for sure, for object detection and so on, this is a state of the art. So now for Pascal VOC, as we showed, this type of architecture are, uh, are much more powerful. And now they are extended to many other areas. So now uh, people are doing it also for uh, 3D data, so like Kinex, you can do it for actual recognition. There's been shown for many other things that these learning approaches are working with speech. An interesting um, uh, development, and now it's kind of people try to understand this area, is try to do visualization at every single output of the layer. So, what happens if I take the output of this layer? What would this layer represent, and so on? So, there are a few of these analyses. Another thing that, that people have been working now, and now it's getting standard, is instead of even the image as input, so all the pictures of the image, you can give some specialized, let's say, a bolstering window, this is one of the standard now, so you get some kind of better object localization crop in some way, you put it in the network and then it shows you what much better than then just using the picture. So one of the main problems here is that you have so many parameters, so we talk about 60 million parameters, so just tuning and getting the right parameters here, and it takes you a week, so anyway, weeks to do the training, you cannot make mistakes, because then it will take you forever to do it. So, um, again, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm encouraging my guys to do deep learning stuff, but I'm not uh, a big fan of deep learning, at least not, not at the moment. I think it's important to know them, it's important to have the things. Uh, one thing that is, uh, it's very popular nowadays is to, you do, you do, you learn the features automatically using deep learning, and then you use them in your algorithm. Okay, so you have better features, and then you put them in your, in your new traditional pipeline. So instead of using, I don't know, Tiff or other things, you get deep learning features, and then you put them in your, in your pipeline. And this seems to be the best solution. Um, one, one thing that is also standard uh, here with deep learning, what, what people use right now, so this is standard, they use ImageNet, so this is a huge data set with labels. They use ImageNet to, to, to pre-train the data set and then you just adapt this one to your image collection. So you get the features from the ImageNet, so you hope that ImageNet is, 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 hope that is, is diverse enough so the features are representative and then you apply them to your collection. And that one seems to work pretty well. to do um, this analysis. 
And that one seems to work much better now. But it's still something that people this year, I've seen a few, a few of these methods. It's still, it's still kind of very, very hot to discuss how, how do you do transfer learning? How do you put them together? So deep transfer learning. <coughs> okay, so for the next hour or so, I will go a little bit through all these features, through all these modules, and this will show you some of the solutions that, uh, well, my students have been working on. And um, I think it's, I'm not going into details of the optimization part, so here is, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to show you some ideas of, about machine learning, how do we do structured learning, how do we do, what kind of optimization we do. Trying to solve these things, you have the images part, then we move towards video, and then we get some kind of complex events. Right, so here the complex event will be into the, the part of the, this is multimedia event detection, this is part of the track bits, which is a strong competition. Um, and there we obtain quite, quite important results. So just, just, just to show you. So we go from feature selection to semi-supervised learning, so practically feature selection together with unlabeled data. Here I'm going to show you how you need to take the digital information. Here we have some kind of uh, classified statistic representation, practically what we have when we have many complex, uh, many complex events, complicated events, we try to learn a common representation of this event. For example, a few events that you do, I don't know, landing a fish, swimming, uh, boats, uh, I don't know, sailing boats and so on, they may have some hidden common representation. So we try to use that one as, uh, let's say, the core element and then we add things on top of it. And that seems to work very well. And then we have to try to do knowledge adaptation. So if I have some label examples and I have some unlabeled videos or external videos, can I use this information? For example, I have a video, if I want to learn something like learning a fish. So this is quite a complex event, right? It's quite uh, heterogeneous. Many people do fishing in different ways. They can get a fish in different ways. And then, but I have a video of, let's say, uh, I know what the concept of uh, fish. I know what the concept of, uh, I don't know, pulling something. Then if I have these videos, can I use this information to enhance my, let's say I have only a few examples of learning a fish, but I have other kind of videos that are related to that. Can I use this information to, to obtain uh, better results? So this is the knowledge adaptation part. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so the feature selection. So the idea is here, how do we really have an optimization framework in which we go from some feature that we have, let's say you obtain a lot of features. How do I do feature selection so that so I'm obtaining first a compact, a compact feature representation, so I'm going to reduce my feature space. And in the other sense, I want to obtain better accuracy because the feature that I'm using are going to have to be less noisy and going to have less redundancy. Like some of the features are redundant and these are not good for machine learning. Okay? So images in general are represented by various features. The feature selection part is supposed to eliminate noise and redundancy. And it's supposed to improve both classification accuracy and the computational efficiency, right? And then, in general, we have the fact that the web images are usually multi-layered, right? So, considering this as a motivation, how can we really do this in an efficient way? So that was one of the things, so the paper that we have, this one, this is in Transitional Multimedia in 2012. Okay, so there are some approaches to feature selection. I mean, this has been already from, this is the standard to work. I mean, this, this is the second edition. We went the earlier edition, I think it's from the 90s. So this is in um, pattern classification. They were talking about uh, feature selection, right? So this is the standard. Uh, it, 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 it's a problem that has been forever. Right? So people with, with thinking how to do this. In this tradition approach, the problem is it's, it's not so, the, the approach is not efficient because what they do, they look at each feature independent and then they try based on some kind of score, they say, well, this feature is more informative than another feature. But they just take the features independently. This is the problem. Um, you can have some, some more recent approaches, this is from 2011, in which you have some sparse feature selection, so you, kind of, you, you try to do joint evaluation of the features. But these guys, they do not cons consider the concept correlation. In other words, they just look at features, low-level features, as some kind of intent, instantiations, but we want to use this feature selection considering that we know that some of the concepts are correlated. Concept would be, let's say, obvious. 
So I know, for example, that a cow is correlated to a horse more than a cow would be correlated to a, to a, to a car. Right? So there are some, 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 uh, some of the concepts are not completely independent. So if we know that, I know that the features of these two similar stuff are correlated, so I can use this one for doing feature correlation. So this is exactly what we try to do. Yeah, so we want to have a sparse model. We want to learn this, this shared subspace learning. Uh, can be done in batch mode, right? So we evaluate the features jointly across all data points, and then consider the correlation between different concept lines. So this is things that we want to do. So how do we do it? Well, that's again some kind of standard machine learning. I'm not going into details, but just when we are going to see in many places this type of equation. So here, what you want to do, you want to obtain a, low, uh, a loss function. Yeah, so this is a, uh, so this is a loss function. Uh, you want to obtain this W, that is the, the, the projection of your original feature space into the new space, which is sparse. So in other words, um, has less color that has the one you would have. So instead of having, I don't know, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of elements here, you can go up to, let's say, a few thousand. It's quite important. And then in general, what you do in order to avoid overfitting, in order to avoid other kinds of things, you have this regularization, regularization term. So here, it is called the L to 1 norm. Practically, what you do, you do the sum, this is the square root over, this is sum of the, over the, the, the columns, and then you do the sum over the row. And this regularization is good for overfitting. So avoid overfitting and guarantees optimize our to be sparse, right? So many of these rows will sink to zero. So this W will be as a combination coefficient for the most dis discriminative features. So what you do is just combine the columns in such a way that you obtain uh, better results, and that W is sparse. Yes. So this is the, this, this W is what you want. This is, this is very generic, right? So this is just the standard optimization procedure. This is, this, uh, it, there are no details in there. This is just a standard stuff. So what we try to do, so this is an, uh, an instantiation of that. So we want to discover this shared su subspace in which this Q, yes, assume that, so if you have a database and you have multi-labels, right? So you have an image in which you have different labels, right? So you could have, for example, an image which is labeled uh, parade, equal, and sweet. So you have many of these images in which you have multi labels. And you want to, 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 to say, to, to have this common representation in which, for example, assume that these labels will share some common attributes. For example, if you have parade people in streets, you would have the shared people attributes without their one other image labeled as party. In other words, between a parade and party, what is shared, it, it's hidden, you don't know, but this is, this is just an example. So people are common both in parties and in a parade. Okay? So if I know, if I have a people detector, I can use this one to detect both parades and uh, parties. This is just an example, could be many other things. You know? So this is just a hidden example, but you could have so many other things, right? So this is your shared subspace. Here, for some particular reason, you have to put this one to be uh, quadratic, so it has to be uh, uh, one, so this is uh, one of the things. And, um, in your, uh, so this is, uh, this is your feature selection part. So you can just represent this W as a linear part. This is a V plus the shared space of P. So you have any, any matrix can be, can be um, um, decomposed into this, this kind of element. Right, so this is a, the, um, uh, the objective function. So practically here, if you put them together, so this is the standard example for the loss. Right, so you want your features, so this is the original feature space. This is the feature selection, these are the labels. So you want this one to be minimized, right? So you want your labels, the, the input space after the feature selection to be as close as possible to your label, to your ground truth, so it's the standard. Then you have the, the regular, uh, regularizers. So this one regulates the information of each specific label, so it makes sure that you don't get overfitting. And here you are penalizing for complex Right, so you don't want to have very complex representation, that's why you put a regularizer in there. <coughs> I'm not going into details on how do we really solve this one. If you are interested again in the, in the paper, 
in our paper, uh, well, we have some demonstration that this is convergence. It's, we have some demonstration how do you really solve this one? Do you have some representation of this one? You, you just decompose it and then you obtain an optimal, an optimal way to do it. I'm, again, I'm not going into details. But this is some, some kind of standard approach. So here, what we, we consider, again, we have this shared subspace. As I said, it's hidden, so we, we, don't, we don't observe it. But we just make the assumption that some of these concepts, like parade, party, some of the pretty high-level concepts, they do share some hidden structure. Okay? And what we do when we do this feature selection, we just say, that we don't really look at this as a low-level feature correlation, but we also say that at a high level, we also have this correlation. And when we do optimization, we keep in mind this stuff. So this is, uh, this is exactly the idea. Some examples, so this is, um, so we had two data sets. So this is uh, Microsoft Research Asia, uh, multimedia data. So we have, so this has, It's an, a wide, it's another data set with multiple labels. So you have 81 classes. So you have uh, 10,000 images with multiple labels. They are in 81 trends. And you have a testing set size of about 200,000 images. So we use some features, so color uh, choreogram, uh, edge direction, histogram, wave detection, some standard features. And then we apply this one and we show that it's working better and stuff. And we were comparing with some of the um, standard um, uh, feature selection stuff. So we have the one we're using feature score, all the features. So the most important is all the feature when, when we don't do feature selection, then we show that it's working better. And then we have different types of features of the spectrum feature selection. This is some standard one. This is the group lasso with the regression. These are again features in which they consider, they don't consider the, the correlation at, um, at the concept part. Some of the numbers here, Again, so this is a standard, uh, this is mean average precision, uh, this is a micro area under the curve, this is a macro area under the curve, so there are different model, uh, different numbers to, to evaluate the performance of your algorithm, and you see for all the stuff, we obtain much better results. So you go, uh, in some cases maybe it's not significant, but in some other it's quite, quite important. For anyways wide, it's, it's much better, at least for many of the things. So mean average precision can go from, if you use all the features, 0.081, to 0 0.094, so it's quite, um, it's quite a big increase. Right? So using all features is not only is not efficient, but it's also, um, uh, the accuracy is not good. This is when you have uh, uh, 10 uh, classes training data, so we use the training data for 10 classes, if you use for 20, again, you have similar numbers. Um, the influence of the selective features, uh, of course, in some sense, there are very few features. You may not have enough information. So then the accuracy is pretty bad. Then, if you increase the number of features, your accuracy starts to go up. And then, all of a sudden, when you go over a particular threshold, let's say over 300 in this case, 250 there, it starts to go down. Because there, now you, you, you add in redundancy and noise and so on. So, of course, there is always a trade off. So, here, what you do in general, there is no way you can learn this particular number, so where to stop. But you can get at least an idea, you can, you can also have some, uh, um, uh, a part of your testing set, you can, you, can, uh, you, can, you can try to learn these parameters on that uh, um, part of the set and then apply it to the testing set. So then it's important, so you see for both uh, data sets, you have this kind of curves. You go from, if you have very few features, you don't have enough information, you increase the features, and then you obtain an optimal result, and then you go down when you, you, when you start using too many features. But this is a standard approach everywhere. Well, this is also to prove that uh, our algorithm is converging, and you see in many cases it's just, uh, well, after five, six uh, iteration, it's already converging. Right, so it is, it, it is a convex, it's a convex optimization algorithm. So integration of shared social learning and joint feature selection with sparsity. Um, it's evaluating the feature importance uh, jointly, and we also use the correlation of the correlation between the labels. Yeah, so it's promising results on the last scale web image sets. Um, four, now, semi-supervised learning, again, we do feature selection, but we also want to use, if you don't have enough uh, label data, 
can we use, can we try to do semi-simplified learning in which we use unlabeled data? So I have images in there in which I don't have label for it. I know that some of these classes, let's say cards or postcards, whatever, may be present, but I don't know that they are there. Okay. And this is, this, is, this, is quite, uh, this is quite important because we'll, we'll provide with some bulk of data that is useful. Yeah, so again, we have various features. You have the irrelevant feature that may even be useful. The semi-supervised learning using the limits available labels in an efficient way. And it is natural to integrate semi-supervised with feature selection. Right, that's another paper on transactional multimedia that we, we had. So this is the standard, uh, what we have, the semi-supervised feature selection. We have the spark feature selection as well. Right, so in the supervised learning requires fully uh, labeled training data. So what we want to do? First, we have this efficient feature analysis, what we had before. We also introduce a new thing, what is called the graph Laplacian. This is a standard approach for semi-supervised learning. So I have it in the, well, this is the, the standard approach in which you have the training images, you have different features. Here is our method that I will talk next. Then from here, you obtain spark coefficient. You have the feature vector from the, the testing images, and then you obtain the arbitrary results. So practically what you do, you get for each testing image, you have this kind of get automatic annotation like graph, dot, animal, mountain, sky, and so on. Right, so this is, this, is, this is what you want to do. Okay, so this is what we had before. Right, so again, the, this is a, a L21 normal uh, nor regularized model. Again, what we had before. Now, on top of that, we want to incorporate semi supervised learning using the graph Laplacian. So, what does it mean? It means, so you, I have any matrix can be decomposed in, two, in these two ways. So, one in which I'm having this is a diagonal matrix in which practically I'm having the sum over elements of A. And A represents practically the neighboring part. So Aij is one if feature Xi and Xj are k areas neighbors, and it's zero other way. Right? So I'm looking at the stuff and I'm making the neighboring matrix. So this is a standard way to con this called the graph Laplacian. OK, now we are using money, uh, money for regularization. So again, we assume that all the data, so the label data and label data will lie on the same manifold. In other words, my labeled data is coherent with my unlabeled data. So my labeled data is from the same distribution as that my labeled data. I don't know the labels, but I assume that they are all lying on the same manifold. In other words, if I'm having images of cows, right, I assume that in my unlabeled data I also have cows. If I have unlabeled data about uh, moon uh, scapes, let's say on a kind of, uh, uh, well, things about completely relevant, that will not help me at all. So my assumption is that the distribution of the label and label data, they are from the same domain. So then they are from the same manifold. So here what I'm having, I'm having again, this is the standard stuff in which I'm saying that the feature selection thing and my labels has to be correct. Well, this is a bias term in the sense that if the, if the features are not aligned, so this is kind of the, the standard term, it's not so important there. And what we do, we define a predictive label matrix F, and we want to, to minimize this F so that we obtain this type of consider the, um, the element that this is labeled on a label, we try to, to do the trace of the matrix so that we obtain the utilization. Again, I'm not going into many details, but in the end, the final objective function is something like this. So the good thing about that, we are able to get F, so the predictive label, W, the feature selection, and B, so this is the bias term simultaneously. And <coughs> the optimal is W, which is what we, ca we care about. This is a feature selector. It's obtained, it can be utilized directly for classification as does this W, that feature selection. So once we do this learning, we incorporate here the unlabeled information. And based on that, we can obtain the labels at, uh, at the end. Yeah, so this is the loss function, and we try to optimize this. And this is, again, the regularizer to impose that this W is sparse. Again, here you had image annotation with the same data set as before. We had more classes now, and we were using another data set, this Corel data set. And we also applied it on, on video concept detection. So here, uh, again, we had, uh, so this is a Kodak one. It's some standard one. There are 22 concepts of video. So we have like 3,000 video frames. 
the care media it's a data set about uh, well um, daily activity into uh, this is an hospital type of patient elderly person doing things so again there were five this type of events like somebody falling moving eating I don't remember exactly all the things and we also had the 3d motion data analysis this is a human EVA uh, so we had the 3d data there were 10 classes uh, 10,000 frames several uh, comparison algorithms so um, uh, let's see there was also the one that I presented you before. I think it's called, uh, I don't know, here, this one, Structural Feature Selection with Sparsity. That was the one that I presented you in the previous methods. Uh, well, some examples, some results. Again, SFSS, this is uh, the one that we have. So this is for Corel. This is for uh, Microsoft Research Asia data set. So in most of the cases, this is uh, on top. This is for video concept recognition that, again, in this case, is working much better. This is for the 3D motion data for the human EVA. So it's much, much better than before. Well, so this is a comparison with several um, semi-supervised uh, learning approaches. Again, in our case, our, it's, uh, it's better for most of the, depending on the percentage of label training data. So here, if you have 2% of label training data, of course, the, uh, the results for mean average prediction is much lower, but you see that with our algorithm, we are able to obtain much better results than the standard ones. And then, of course, when you have 50% unlabeled data, so 50 labeled data, you obtain much better results. Uh, so here it's uh, when you use label training data, so when all the data is uh, labeled, so like 10%, so you see here only the labeled data. Here, when you add the unlabeled data, you obtain some, some improvement, right? So even if you would have, let's say, a very limited amount of training data, like 10%, if you add unlabeled data, you can obtain another uh, jump of about, I don't know, a mean average precision, like 2%, uh, 5%, is quite, quite important. Again, this is convergent, it's, an optima it is, it's a convex um, algorithm, it's again uh, converging after like about eight to nine iterations, depending on the data set. Um, it's, so this is good because it's doing cost saving, it's boosting performance with the usage of unlabeled data, and um, it's a clear advantage when few training data are labeled, right? So you can also, uh, it's applicable to a variety of applications, so we use it for many things. So that's again a standard approach for doing optimization. Okay, uh, an interesting approach that is also in many cases you may have different type of modalities. So the thing that we were using here was to use text analysis and visual, so text information and visual information, right? In many cases, images have text information associated to them. But, um, so this is a standard approach in which people were using text to, you, to, to help vision. Right? In some sense, that's, so assuming that they take something like Wikipedia, right? So in the Wikipedia, you have an image associated to some text. You know that that text is saying something about the image. So using that, you can learn concept to help your image or visual information. Our idea here is to use exactly the opposite. Right, so we try to do, uh, let me see. So the idea was that what if, if you learn, so most of the people will learn concept from text, right? If you have a large corpora of text, you can learn some attributes about particular objects. I don't know, you learn that uh, cars are staying on the road, you learn that thing, this is what causes it. But we were thinking, some, some cases may not be so obvious. A typical, let's say a trivial example would be, if you just read text, it's very hard to learn that the banana is here. Why? Well, because it's so evident, nobody's going to write in text, I'm eating a yellow banana. Because everybody knows that banana is here. But then, a silly algorithm, how does it learn that banana is here? Of course, from the visual point of view, if I show the examples of bananas, you see that most of the bananas are going to be yellow. So learning that a banana is yellow is trivial from the visual data. It may not be trivial from the textual data. Okay? So the idea was that what if we just use these attributes, both from visual, some of the attributes are, are easier to be learned from the visual data, some of them are easier to be learned from textual data. So we want to put this together. And just if you do this analysis on both sides, we could obtain better results overall. Okay, so first of all, the distribution of semantics, probably you know more than I know in that, is that the word meaning can be derived from the context, okay? So this is an example I have from uh, my colleague, uh, Marco Baroni. So let's say he feels a bumpy move, passes around, and we all drank some. Okay, so this is, this 
is an inverted word. If you don't know what it is, because it doesn't exist. But even if you don't know, but just reading the text, you can imagine what it could be. What would it be? A cow? It's an animal? No, really. Here, we found a little hairy bumpy moon flitting behind the tree. Okay, so even if it's the same word, I mean, even if you don't know what it is, just from the context of text, you can learn what it is. Okay, so this is exactly what says the distribution semantics. So again, this bumpy moon is just, it's not a word. It's just a made up stuff. Can be anything in there. So even, Im imagine that you read something in, in a foreign language. So for example, I'm reading now uh, Italian. Uh, in Italian, I'm reading some, uh, the latest novel of um, Umberto Eco. Okay, so I understand 95% of the words. Sometimes I don't know a word. But I'm doing exactly like here. So we, I understand everything. I don't know what this is. But just from the context, I can tell that this should be some sort of an animal, right? Why? Because it's hairy, because uh, it's lit behind the tree, because it's little, because of some other thing. While here, it should be some sort of a bug or cup or whatever, right? Because I'm drinking out of it. So even if I don't know what that is, I can learn it from the from text. Yeah, so, <coughs> so this is an example with a banana. Very few people write that bananas are yellow, okay? So in other words, getting some attributes like yellow in this case, it's very hard to get it from textual data, right? So what we did analysis is the text versus images, which semantics are captured? Do images improve upon text-only semantics? As we show, it does. And then how does the distribution hypothesis work for images? Yeah, so from text, what we do, we just get text like that. So the word that we want to get is moon, and then we get some of the things that are attributes like moon is shining, moon is cold, light, crescent, and other kind of things. Then we represent uh, it as, um, as a table in here, and then we try to get you know, the, the similarity. In other words, is this moon closer to the sun from semantic points of view or to the dog? And then what we do, we get analysis from the text, and then we, re we represent them, and then we get, let's say, the, the cosinus similarity, and I can tell that the moon is closer to the sun from the semantic point of view that, uh, that is to the dog. Okay, so this is text, very simple text uh, distribution semantics from text. We can do the same for, for visual analysis. So we get the bag of words, for example. We do it the same, we get the uh, images of the moon. We get representation of that. We get the images of the moon, sun, and dog. We get the shadow shines, and this is the textual attributes, we get the visual attributes, and based on the in the table, and then we represent the closeness of, this, uh, of these elements by concatenation. Let me go to the results. Um, so these are some of the concepts that we learn. So let's say for the, for, uh, these are the, um, um, the subjects, like cabbage, carrot, cherry, deer, dishwasher, and so on. This is, this is the attributes you can learn from the text, like, uh, you know, oven is electric, onion is fresh, uh, hat is white, and so on. These are some of the things that you learn from the image side. And in some cases, it's kind of obvious, right? Like the, core, the carrot is, is, uh, is orange, or the cherry is red. Some other cases, for example, the hat you learn that is old, which is not so evident, but somehow you learn it from the visual data. And this is what we did getting from textual and visual information. Okay, so here, for example, for a sparrow, in text, you learn it's a wild sparrow, while here, in, um, in from the visual information, you learn that the sparrow is little, which makes sense, right? It's a small bird, so it it's could, uh, could make sense. You, you never say, I, I'm, I've seen a small pair, a sparrow. Well, the sparrow, it is small in general, so you don't have to say it. While from the visual information, you can learn these type of things. So let me go to the results. So if you take text only, so this is, um, I think it's a mean average, it's a sperm and correlations, okay? So text, it's 0.6 uh, alone. Image alone is 0 0.43, so it's much worse. However, if you put them together, you do some smooth linear stuff, you go much better than the text alone. So again, the visual information has complementary information to the text, so you can improve text analysis by just using visual information. And then, well, the, word, the meaning of a word can be derived from the context. So again, if you get uh, the, um, uh, the bounding box there, you get the information from the context, you can start learning that uh, you can obtain better uh, detectors. Let me go through this. Uh, well, so these are the human uh, correlations. So it's, this is between, uh, these are um, the um, categories from the Pascal VOC, like uh, bottle, chair, whatever. And then what you see is that you can, you can learn quite some, some good correlation. For example, uh, so the whiter it is, the better correlation it is. For example, I don't know, let me get something, horse and, Cow, for example, you get quite, quite, uh, 
and so on. So this is an object, so this is using automatic localization and stuff, and you can see that you get more or less the same type of structure. Not identical, but again, this correlation is very similar to the one of the human. So here the human were asked to, to judge the, um, the correlation between different type of things, so like, I don't know, sofa and, uh, and TV, uh, where was that? The TV monitor, well, it's not so good, and so on. And this is uh, using the surrounding parts. So again, here for some of them, some of them you obtain better results, some other structures. So if you use surrounding and the object location, again, you can obtain better results. Okay, so um, I'm using two more things. Again, it's uh, pretty, pretty fast. So first of all, the classified specific representation. So here, we want to skip the explicit concept detection process because here for some of the concepts, we, we may not have enough training data. So just, for example, I want to, to, to build a detector for the concept parade. But I may not have many videos about parade. Right? But I may have videos about people, I may have videos about march, I may have videos about things that are related to parade. Okay? So I, they, are not related, they, are, they are not labeled as parade, but they can help me to enhance, to have a few labeled videos for parade, but I have some other things that can enhance my detector. <coughs> so here I'm borrowing information from the available multimedia archive, which are related to the various concepts from complicated events. Okay? So we are doing it in the context of multimedia event detection. So this is uh, part of the track bit. So this National Institute of Standard and Technology, they have this uh, stuff in which they want to detect the occurrence of an event within a video clip based on an event kit which contains some text description and some example videos, right? So parade, you have example videos and you have a description in which you said there are uh, many people uh, having music, uh, marching, I don't know what kind of thing, right? So there is some kind of a paragraph, it's an abstract about what the parade is. And this is, and they have, I'm going to show you in the next slides, what kind of concepts do they have. Something very, uh, very, very complex, like you said, landing a fish, repairing and, uh, and changing a tire. So, Many other things, I don't remember now, they are in the next slide. You know? so, so it's very complex, so it's again, it's a wedding, birthday party. There are some videos that can take <coughs> quite long, let's say a, a wedding can, can be a ceremony that takes two hours. Some other things are much, much smaller. Some changing a tire, somebody can do it in three minutes, somebody can do it in half an hour. And they have all this kind of you know, user, um, user uh, uh, recorded videos, home videos. And they want still, you have, 20,000 hours of video, and you still want to detect, let's say, this kind of concept with reasonable high accuracy. Yeah, so you have concepts that they detected as we had before, like sky, tower, flower, building, cars, and so on. And then you have events. Like, so this is basketball, this is changing a tire, I guess, or whatever. This is uh, cooking something, and so on. So the concept, which is uh, abstract or general idea, infer from specific instances. Yeah, so usually it's describable within a single shot. An event, it's an observable occurrence that interests users, right? It's dynamic and has semantic richness, lives within a longer video sequence. As I said, the event can take up to two hours, or a day, or whatever. Yeah, so you want now to bridge this gap between concepts and events. Concepts we already discussed, okay, at least for image analysis. Can also do with video. So detecting cars, animals, uh, cows, uh, whatever you want to do. Events is something more complex that may event a lot of concepts, but also relationships, also in coherence, many other things. Okay? So, you want to do. In the definition that we have here, they are in videos because it's, more, uh, it's less ambiguous. In image, you can also define an event, like if you put the coherence of many things, but it's a little bit less. Uh, um, I mean, again, you can infer, for example, we were when in our CDPR paper, we were talking about riding a horse. It's, it's still an image. Riding a horse, you can define as an event, which is the horse and the person on top of the horse, which is riding a horse. Again, it's not static. You could also kind of stay on the horse. It's not necessarily riding, but again, you can infer from that. But in general, in a video, it's definitely well be better defined. So, <coughs> so for... Uh, Annotation, so here associated with media data with one or multiple semantic labels, right? So here you can say mountain, sky, snow, here you can say airplane, sky, uh, whatever, other kind of things. For events, 
you detect the exact set of constant events through the pre-trained detector. So in some of the cases, you can just have some pre-trained, you have some examples where you have a lot of training data, and you can just pre-train this kind of thing. This is a kind of intermediate representation that you have. So in the track feed, you may have examples, as I said, in sport, news, repetitive patterns, surveillance, other kind of things, right? And you have kind of more complicated events, like assembling a shirt. It's not something that it's, it's very, I mean, even if you have to, to, um, to explain in words, how, what is assembling a shirt? Yeah, we came there, we left the bags, we took out the tent, we put the pole first, then we tied it, whatever. There are all these kind of things that you would do. And if you think about it, assembling a shelter is not just this one way of doing it. You can do it in many ways. It can be done by one person, it can be done by five persons, depending on the, of the tent, depending on the shelter, depending on many things. But you still want to, if you see a video about that, you can tell, okay, this is assembling a shelter and it's not cooking your uh, eggs. And you know it, even if you, you, even if you haven't seen the video before. So you want to still be able to detect these elements because there are some, some shared common things. Now, so this is, for example, uh, this is landing a fish, right? If somebody is driving on the lake, it's making a hole in the lake, and then it's putting the, well, the road, and then it's getting the fish out. This is, this is another example. This is, again, landing a fish in which they go by boat. They, they put uh, whatever, the, they, they, they send their roads down, and then they get the fish out. This is, this is two videos, these are, well, uh, examples from two videos which represent the same event. But from the visual point of view, from many things you say, but this is completely different from this. Again, here I put only the, um, um, the, the keyframes, but if you would view the video, the, the actual action here is exactly the same. It just goes there and you fish. Okay? Here you fish on a proton lake, here you go on the sea or whatever, it doesn't matter. So this is, we, this is why this MED is very difficult. Okay, so. <coughs> so we want to learn concept-based representation. The limit is there. It's heavily dependent on the concept detector. So what detectors you have available, right? You may, you, you may not have detector for everything, right? So if you think about it, let's say landing a fish, maybe you have a detector for a boat, maybe you have a detector for the fish, maybe you have a detector for taking the fish out of the water, maybe you have many other detectors. You may not have them available. If you do, if you get very much better representation, the requirement of the classifier are very independent. So you want to use available multimedia archives to enhance your detection. So we want to learn intermediate representation by exploiting the target video and external video archive together. Yeah? And integrate the representation inference and classify it into a joint framework. And now we get, again, the standard approach that's what we had before. So this is the multimedia event detector, this is the loss function, this is the regularizer. Okay? So giving a standard concept-based detector, assuming that you have already a standard detector, concept representation, use M annotating external videos from C classes to pre-train C classifiers. Yeah, so like uh, you need one for each intermediate content, so fish or boat for landing a fish. This is standard that you already have, you already pre-cooked this kind of thing. Okay, then for each training or testing video, yeah, the classifier fish are applied to detect the intermediate content. I just take the concept that I already have and I'm trying to detect things that I can detect. I see, oh look, here I get the fish, here I get uh, whatever. And then, the problem is here that this detector and F, yeah, which is the detector are trained independently, because at first you do pre-cooked and then you apply it to what you have. But you would want to do this together in a common framework, and this is exactly what we did in here. So, again, this is the same as we had before. So this is, um, the concept representation, this is the common uh, space. You want to avoid arbitrary scaling, that's why you put this to be uh, rectangular and to preserve the information. Here we have not only the training label, but also we have the target and external videos. These are the labels for the target and external video, and this is the intermediate representation. Now this is, again, you assume that external based video and constant based video have a common intermediate representation. So there are some common things between them. So the videos I have external, they have something in common with the videos that I, so I want to analyze. But if I want to detect something in between both people, I have videos about people. Even if I don't explicitly say it. Of course, as I said, if I have videos about something completely different, then it's completely, it will not tell me anything. So again, we had um, the target videos, so we have MED 2001 to 15 events. We talk about uh, thousands of hours of video here. 
And then we also had external videos of this, um, uh, the Trek V2001 semantic indexing tax development set. Here we, we eliminate uh, the concept with few positive examples because we wanted to have reason, quite good, um, quite uh, good um, uh, accuracy here. And then we had 65 concepts related to human environment objects. Again, these are probably not enough, but we had some kind of standard thing. So what can a human do? Oh, it can just retain, it can walk, it can cook, it can jump, it can do many things. And we believe that these 65 somehow will help some of this event detection. So we will have, I think I have it here, like, so these are the type of events that we, we, we try to, this is the trick we start, making a cake. Okay, so humans are involved here today. Betting a run, which is again baseball, assembling a shelter, feeding an animal, attempting a board trick, working on a woodworking project, landing a fish, wedding ceremony, changing a vehicle tire, birthday party, flash mob gathering, getting a vehicle unstuck, grooming an animal. So these are the type of the 15 events that we try to detect. And if you think about it, these are quite unstructured. This is quite, quite complex, okay? So for that, we learn, as I said, 65 related concepts. I don't remember now exactly which one. They were, were definitely people detector, cars, animals. I, I don't remember, right? So some of these things would be useful. For example, detecting a car would be useful for this particular event. Um, maybe, I don't know, detecting an animal will not be useful for this, but it will be useful for that, and so on. Maybe people, especially many people, will be good for the flash of gathering and less for changing the vehicle tire. Okay, but we don't do it explicitly. We just put it in the optimization framework. Uh, ah, we also have like parade, making a sandwich, working on a swing project, parkour, repairing an, uh, an appliance. Okay, so this has, these are home videos taken by many people. We talk about thousands of hours of videos, kind of completely unstructured. Everybody is just doing it. They were labeled into these categories. Well, we have several uh, analyses uh, here again. So this is, uh, we talk about uh, mean average precision. It's pretty, pretty bad. I mean, some of them are very, very difficult. Again, our, our approach, well, we are comparing with many other things in mo most of the cases are uh, obtained the best results. I'm not going through this, but you, you got the idea. Uh, it's important here. So this is what, what you obtain if you, um, if, you, if, you, if you start adding some more external concepts. If you go to 30 concepts, uh, you may get uh, lower result than if you go 65, right? So the more concept you get, you obtain better results in general. Well, it's convergent, and uh, well, it seems to, to work pretty good. Okay, the last one, which is related. So we want to, to do the same, but now we have very few positive examples, okay? Um, we want to borrow strength from other multimedia resources and we use these concept-based videos as auxiliary, auxiliary resources. Uh, we have no requirement for consistency between auxiliary and the target domain in feature type. Yeah? It is flexible in the situation the data collection platform change augments their capabilities, meaning that if I have this dictionary as before, I want to be generic to any other thing. So I can just learn this kind of universal dictionary if you want, and then I can apply it to many other things. So I'm trying to kind of do transfer uh, domain adaptation from this concept to whatever we have in there. So landing a fish, okay? I, I may have different type of concept like this element, I can get detector of water, I can get the fish, I can get the roads, I can get the boat and so on. And they are all related, right? This is some uh, animation that my student put together. So here I'm extracting the features. Here are the features from landing a fish. And I want to see how these metrics, which are concept related to this, would help me get a better representation, a better feature selection for this particular feature, okay? I'm doing this sparse model, and then based on that, I'm kind of eliminating some of the features. For example, this may not be common, or this may be common to all of them, and I'm obtaining another space which would be more representative for this. Okay, I'm also considering here that I'm having different modalities. So it looks something like this. I start first, I associate the low-level feature representation and the high-level concept. That's again what I had before. So this is the target training videos. This is the event detection for one, one category, and I want this one to be consistent. So this is the feature selection in this case. I want to be consistent with the labels. You do the same for the auxiliary videos. It's exactly the same type of things. 
then I'm saying that if I have two different modalities, let's say audio and, and video, I want to have this representation, so the labels, they have to be consistent, right? So if I have the same event, if I'm using audio or visual information, the label has to be in the end the same. So I'm doing this kind of thing in which I'm imposing that these two things are still correct. Right? Which makes sense, right? If I'm getting different modalities for, for, a, for the same video, the label will have to be the same. Right? And now, practically, what we do, so this is the, the difference from what I presented you before. Right? And now, if you put all this together, so you have this auxiliary concept base, these are the training videos. Why did I put what? Ah, it, it's left to minimize, yes, I didn't put it, yes, but it minimizes here, well, here it, it's, it's coming here, practically. So it's, it's in the minimum here. <coughs> <coughs> so you have to minimize here, you get the WT and, um, and this PT. So you have to minimize the stuff. So these are auxiliary videos, these are the, tra uh, the target training videos, so this is one modality, this is another modality, and, and then you try to, you have to put some regularizer to avoid the overfitting. Again, we had different data set, we have different training videos. Um, here we had uh, another data set, so this is UCF50. It's most of the stuff probably, if you do actual recognition, you probably know it. It's some kind of actions like sport events, like uh, jumping, uh, running, uh, all these kind of things. And uh, so these are auxiliary videos, about 6,081 videos. And this is some auxiliary videos from the track with stuff. So it's a measure of 3,000. Uh, well, we have different features. We have 10 positive examples for each of the features, and then we show that with using um, different uh, um, auxiliary examples, we obtain better results. It's our different comparison algorithm. So some of us, it's some of the stuff, it's what I presented before. And then for each of them, we had this type of analysis. Again, it's hard to tell here, but in most of the cases, what we obtain, it's, it's better than, uh, than what we had before. So this is for different type of elements. I'm not going into details. For, for my, oh no, in overall, it's, it's, it's much better. So the average results, again, in our case, um, the results are, are in general better, depending on, uh, on, the, um, on the measure that you are getting. If you use different auxiliary video, you obtain better different results, depending. Uh, if you do knowledge adaptation, when we have with auxiliary data or without auxiliary data, in most of the cases, you, you obtain better results. For example, I don't know, attempting a board trick, you, you obtain much better results. In other cases, it's not necessarily true. But in most of the cases, if you use auxiliary data, we'll do, you will do better than, uh, than without, which makes sense, right? So you, you add extra information, you had the extra information. So again, you do learning. Uh, you don't really do overfitting here because what you have, you assume that in the world, even if you don't have enough label, you have examples, you have some standard things. Of course, again, if the auxiliary data are completely relevant, are just taken from something completely different, then, of course, they are not, they are not relevant, they are not going to help you at all. Why do you not overfit? Well, because, um, especially if your auxiliary data is very diverse, uh, so, uh, and, and then also you have the hidden state, you don't know what you're looking for. In the end, yes, yes, but here the, the data is so sparse, I mean, the, the, the events are so complex that whatever you add in there, it will not help much. I mean, it will not, you will not get too much to overfitting. Again, the numbers are pretty low, so. But then here, why, why is it difficult to get the data just to Well, Thanks.
Anyway, so what we did practically, we focused on image and video annotation and multimedia event detection. So I showed you this kind of five solutions. Again, there are many things that uh, we are working on. So we went from concepts to events. So the concepts, again, which is why I discussed in the first part, is doing object detection, object recognition, object in the context, of course. Events is something complex, in which context of context is something could be in an image or in a shot. An event is something could be longer, it should be in a video. Right, and this is a progressive progress, a pro progressive process. And now what we do, and this is ongoing stuff, so, um, well, we are harnessing different features jointly, a symbiotic solution. What do you mean symbiotic? <coughs> Why is that different? Well, we try to do it in a different way. I mean, again, maybe, maybe it's too strong word, but I think it's, uh, we try to use some extra context on top of that. One, one thing that uh, I didn't pretend that there is a, uh, we have a PAMI paper on this, it's um, model the importance of negative examples. And this is, this is something new in the sense that many people will say this is positive, this is negative. Okay? And in general, but the problem is that some negative examples are more negative than others. Okay? And modeling how negative this example, how useful or how less useful are, is quite important. But many people will not consider this. Every, all the negative will be the same, but it's not true. Because it's true that there are some negative things that are still informative because they are kind of related to what you do. It's not exactly what you say. I don't know, I don't know. Swimming uh, and jumping in the water. They are kind of related. They are not exactly the same, but they are related. Of course, uh, grooming an animal is completely unrelated to swimming. So again, modeling the negative example is quite important. So we have a paper on that. I didn't go into that because it was too, uh, too complex. So I think we had an ACM multimedia paper on that. That's it. That one is already published. If you do knowledge adaptation, uh, you can leverage, and you want to leverage unlabeled data in multiple related domains. Yeah, so again, the thing that we, you see here, we wanted to transfer the knowledge adaptation, this kind of thing. So you want to do user centric research problems anyway. So it's kind of, the user will tell you a little bit about the, the, the domain. Okay, so that's about it. Of course, if it's, as I know it was quite a lot. Uh, if you have questions, if you I'll be happy to, to talk to you, of course. I mean, again, you can have most of these things. If you want to get details about the publication things, you can, you can easily get them from my page. I want to give, to get an idea about uh, how this optimization thing look like. Let me go you to see if I can find something. Um, just to, to give you a, a glance, I'm not going into details. Let me take the, the PhD thesis of my uh, former student. To give you an idea about uh, yes, no, no, but that was just a the, the, uh, that one is just a cartoon, so it doesn't matter. That fifteen percent, it's completely irrelevant. It just it's just a number. That one was a cartoon. Actually, I will show you this quite nice for the next cartoon. Um, that, that, that one is just a cartoon. Could be anything. Could be seven. Could be fifteen. Could be twenty-five. I'm just saying that this level of, of accuracy for the regular yeah. user.
find the truth. 